Good morning. My name is Maureen Boyd. I'm the director of the Carleton Initiative for Parliamentary and Diplomatic Engagement. Welcome to this special Zoom webinar for diplomats. Bienvenue à vous tous et à vous toutes. Comme nous vous avons informé, cette session déroule en anglais. We have a full morning plan for you, but first I want to show you where we should be today at Carleton University. It's been a tradition for the last nine years for the Carleton Initiative to organize an annual orientation for newly arrived diplomats to Canada. Each year offered new diplomats an opportunity to learn about Parliament from the Speaker of the House of Commons, from the Clerk, and from members of Parliament who would talk about their party's priorities, but also about establishing relationships with the diplomatic community. There were presentations on public opinion, panels of journalists who shared their recommended uh, as trusted sources of information and who answered lots of questions. Representatives from the business community spoke about business trends and engaging with Canadian business. The mayor of Ottawa and the CEO of the National Capital Commission talked about engaging with the National Capital Region. The orientation always finished with lunch and a resource fair allowing organizations that provide services and information for diplomats to explain what they do. But above all, it was an opportunity for diplomats to discuss, to network, to meet each other. We hope that next year we'll be holding this event in person, but right now we're going to recreate some of it virtually with the focus not just on newly arrived diplomats, but with presentations and remarks of interest to the entire diplomatic community here in Ottawa and also across the country. Because we are virtual, we are welcoming diplomats from consulates across Canada. A special welcome to all of you. For, today, for today's session, we were received registrations from more than 175 members of the diplomatic community, including more than 65 ambassadors, high commissioners, and chargés d'affaires. We have a great program for you this morning. We've sent it to you, and it's also available on our website, www.carlton.ca slash Carl Diplo, along with the presentations and resource sheets that our presenters will mention. We welcome your engagement on social media. Please tweet your comments or photos. We are at Carl Diplo. And let me recognize our sponsors who help make this happen. Air Canada, CN, Facebook, Forest Products Association of Canada, Insurance Bureau of Canada, GlaxoSmithKline, Nutrien, Suncor, TD Bank, and Toyota. We thank them sincerely for their support. And I would like to mention that we are recording this webinar and content may be used for news, promotional purposes, advertising, inclusion on websites, social media, and any other purpose by Carleton University. And now to start us off, the president, and Vice Chancellor of Carleton University, Dr. Benoit Anton Bacon, assumed his duties in 2018 after an impressive career as a teacher, researcher, and academic administrator at Bishops, Concordia, and most recently at Queen's University. He has a PhD in neuropsychology from the University of Montreal, and his research is focused in the field of cognitive neuroscience. Dr. Bacon. Thank you so much, Maureen. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde, and merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. It's a real pleasure to welcome you virtually to Carleton University, to Ottawa, and uh, for some of you, uh, to Canada. For, for Carleton, to be located in Ottawa is such a great advantage, and we call it the capital advantage. And the presence of your embassies is such a big part of that advantage. We reflect this in our brand new strategic plan, where we commit to it's one of the main axes of the plan, serve Ottawa, serve the world. This is now the 10th year that we do our orientation for newly arrived the diplomats as part of our efforts to maintain very strong links with the diplomatic community. And uh, I, I do want to take this opportunity to thank the organizer of our event uh, today, Maureen Boyd and her team. Thank you so much. And uh, what a rich and wonderful uh, program uh, you have uh, for us. Many thanks 
to all our speakers. Uh, so many good friends of Carlton uh, will be here today. Our great MP, the Honorable Catherine McKenna, uh, David Coletto will be here, uh, Anil Arora from Statistics uh, Canada, and Goldie Hyder, who used to be on our board, uh, among uh, many others, and uh, I'm excited to hear all the presentations. I sincerely hope that you'll find our orientation useful and that you will build a sense of connection to our great university. Um, our university is, of course, very international. We're home to over 31,000 students, and uh, of that number, over 4,000 are uh, international students from 150 countries around the world. And uh, of course, our research enterprise, our research uh, collaborations span all continents. And this is a great time for Carleton. Uh, last week, Maclean's Magazine, which is an authority uh, in terms of, uh, of university rankings, uh, confirmed that we were in the top five of uh, comprehensive universities in Canada, and uh, we were very pleased in particular to rank in the top three for student satisfaction. And in a few weeks, it will become official that over the past two years, our research funding, um, which is a good proxy for research quality and impact, has grown by 50%. 50% increase over two years, which is more than any other university in uh, Canada. So we have great momentum. Today's only the beginning. Over, over your time here, I'm sure we will engage in many professional discussions as to how Carleton can partner with your countries around education, research, and cultural exchanges. So please don't hesitate to call on our experts. Um, to partner with our specific faculties, our research group to organize conference and events to make use of our great uh, facilities, uh, especially once the pandemic is over, our art gallery, our theaters uh, for cultural diplomacy or representation. Maybe you can also consider Carlton and our great programs for your personal choice and your family uh, as well. Let me thank you one more time for taking part in the 10th new newly arrived uh, diplomat orientation. We really appreciate that you took the time to connect uh, with us today, and I sincerely hope that you will find it useful. I wish you wonderful years in Ottawa and in Canada, and I look forward to working with you over the years. Again, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Bacon, for your opening remarks. Our first presenter is going to set the stage for our discussions this morning with his presentation on Canadian public opinion trends, where Canada is and where it's going. He's a Carleton graduate, one of our distinguished alumni. David Coletto is CEO and a founding partner of Abacus Data, a market research and strategy firm. David is one of Canada's leading pollsters and an expert on generational change and millennials. David. Well, thank you, uh, Maureen, and, uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm going to share my screen and get right into it. It's been a uh, as we've all experienced a, a very um, um, unprecedented, I guess it's a word we use all the time now, uh, moment um, over the last seven months. And as a social scientist, um, it's been both a, a, a challenging but also interesting period to be measuring public opinion and looking at how Canadians are reacting to this pandemic and what it means for how we view politics, how we use view public policy. So what I'm gonna do today is, is give you just a, a brief snapshot of, of what we're seeing and, and, and talk a little bit about what the, the, the uh, implications are. I think the three takeaways from uh, my presentation for you are that, you know, a lot of the pre-COVID trends that we were seeing and in, in how Canadian consumers, Canadian employees, Canadian voters uh, were behaving are, are likely to accelerate. And there are some things that I think the pandemic, particularly how we view politics, um, has shifted, and I'll, and I'll speak to those today. But when we look at general satisfaction with, with the federal government, with, with many provincial governments, I think Canadians are feeling quite satisfied um, with how our government has responded to the pandemic, and that has impacted, I think, our evaluations of, of many other things. One, one thing to you know, keep in mind, I think many of you do, being in Ottawa and and, and the impact the United States has on, on the whole world is that we are, as, as, a, as a public, very much influenced by what's going on in the United States. And so we are in constant comparison. And, and the uh, perceptions around how well the pandemic 
has been handled in the United States does play into our own perceptions and our own views of, of how our government has handled things. And, and that leads to a politics, despite general satisfaction, um, a politics that remains quite competitive. We had two by-elections, federal by-elections in Toronto. Uh, yesterday, the Liberals uh, held both. They had them prior and they held both of them. Um, but we did see, uh, although it's not wise always to take too much out of by-elections, we saw still a fairly competitive uh, landscape, particularly in York Centre, a, a more suburban Toronto riding. Uh, the Liberals held on by a few uh, by a few hundred votes, but it was it was close, and I think it 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 confirms some of the polls that I'll share with you today. Uh, the first place I want to start, though, is is where Canadians are today around uh, the pandemic. As you you know interact with with the federal government here and 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 represent your countries uh, here in Ottawa and around the around Canada, um, like I am sure in your countries um, as it is here, this pandemic is top of mind, and it's becoming more. Uh, top of mind, more of a focus for people as the number of cases continues to rise, not only here in Canada, uh, but around the world. We've been tracking public opinion on this really from the very beginning, doing a survey almost every week now. And as of last week, you can see here when we ask people, how worried are you uh, or how worried is the, the, the COVID-19 or coronavirus making you feel right now? 36% um, of Canadians are what I call it an extreme level of concern, saying they're either extremely worried or worried a lot about that pandemic. Another 30% say they are somewhat worried. Very few um, are, are not worried at all. But what's important here is the trend line. This is the percentage of Canadians who say they are extremely uh, worried a lot about the pandemic. You can see that you know back in March when it first started, we still had higher levels than we do today, but it sort of tailed off into the uh, fall. Uh, excuse me, into the summer. And we now are at a level that has been more or less higher than it's been for some time. So we see this rising uh, anxiety, this rising anxiousness around a large number of Canadians. At the same time, we ask people over the last seven days, are you getting more worried or less worried about the pandemic? And the red line represents those who say they're more worried. You can see again, since um, August, really, we've seen a, a real rapid rise in that momentum to, to work towards being more worried about things. We've seen a dip. Um, um, we finished last week a survey. We saw a 12 point drop in that more worried group, but it still remains higher than at any point since the early days of the pandemic. So we are at a different stage and this sort of double uh, polls now indicates clearly a, a, a second wave, not only of cases, but of concern about it. What does this mean? Well, like in other parts of the world, when cases start to rise, people feel anxious. Um, we've seen a, when we compare to June, a nine point increase in those who are worried or concerned about getting the virus themselves. Uh, over half of Canadians are now worried about a family member COVID. This connects to the point that this is still a health crisis in most Canadians' minds. And perhaps most striking is when we ask people, do you think the worst is still to come or do you think the worst of this pandemic is behind us? Uh, just over half of Canadians continue to believe the worst is still to come. It's down again slightly uh, from the middle of October, but it's still higher than it's been at any point since early April. So that's a suggestion that Canadians are very much defensive and concerned about it. So when we look at the public mindset today versus just prior to the pandemic, um, really coming into Canada, you can see that, you know, the, the public's looking at a number of variables, economic variables, unemployment rates up, consumer confidence is down, job insecurity. It's a measure we, we, we measure, you know, how likely are you to lose your job? Um, that's up. Um, almost every Canadian believes Canada is in a recession compared to only 30% uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, it, more people are saving spare cash. As a, as a way to protect against uh, future challenges. Almost half as many believe is a good time to make a major purchase. And from a fiscal and, and federal uh, policy perspective, our federal budget deficit is about $310 billion larger than it was prior to the COVID, uh, prior to the pandemic. So all of these variables impact the way that I think the public is viewing the world. So, you know, the, the current perspective is growing anxiety about COVID-19 as a second spike continues. Um, many think it will take a year or more 
uh, before we're back to normal. Uh, that time horizon has lengthened as this thing has, has gone on longer and longer. And when we think about changes to behavior and preferences, I think the longer this goes on, uh, the more those preferences uh, and behaviors are going to stick. And, and this pandemic becomes far more consequential in terms of the long-term uh, trajectory. But the impact not only on uh, the pandemic has had not only on how we behave, but it's had an impact on how we think about government and the role of, of the state in our lives. Um, generally speaking, when we ask Canadians, do you think things in the world, the United States, Canada, are headed in the right direction or are they off on the wrong track? This is how Canadians feel right now. So you can see that, generally speaking, Canadians aren't optimistic about most things, whether it's their own country, 35%. Uh, the world or the United States. When we look at this across the trend line, you, you actually saw, interesting enough, as the pandemic uh, sort of first started, we saw a spike, actually, uh, an increase in those who felt the country was headed in the right direction. That's more or less deteriorated back to where it was prior to the pandemic. But this period was where governments were working together, Canadians were, were sort of coming together to, to deal with this pandemic. So it actually had a slight boost to, to the public morale in a way, uh, but we're back more or less to where we were. We're about 35% think the country's headed in the right direction. Now the gap between how Canadians feel about their own country and the rest of the world, and in particular the United States, I think are pretty uh, interesting and not surprising and not unique. I think if, if you were to replicate this research in the UK or um, in many European countries or other countries around the world, you'd see the same thing, maybe not in the United States, where even Americans think, most Americans think the, the, the US is not headed in the right direction. But I think this is a starting point. This is the foundation by which um, Canadians have a sense of where the country is going. Um, one of the other interesting things about the pandemic, these are two uh, indicators that we track. The green line represents the federal government's approval rating. Um, and I'll show you the number in a moment where we are today. Um, but the orange line or the yellow line represents the right track number. And you can see that prior to the pandemic, these two numbers um, more or less moved in the same direction. So that as government approval went up, so too did feelings about how the, the country was headed and vice versa. But we saw um, between February and May, when this pandemic saw, uh, started, a real almost um, decoupling of these two variables where, where government approval really went up much higher. You can see up to 58% in the early days of the pandemic. And that, that was 15 points higher than those who felt the country was headed in the right direction. That's, they started coming back together. But one of the, the, the legacies as of now of this pandemic is that Canadians are generally more uh, favorable, have a higher approval of the federal government than they do in terms of where the country's headed. And I think that's an indicator that um, the decisions of the federal government are not driving uh, so much how people feel about the general country because in the midst of a pandemic, that has become the frame by which um, Canadians are understanding the world. Um, one of the ironies in a way, um, not necessarily ironies, but one of the perhaps contradictions, that's a better word, of, of this pandemic is despite people feeling quite anxious about the world and Canada and the pandemic and its impact both socially, health, um, and economically, uh, Canadians are actually have more likely to approve of the federal government today, 45% in our most recent survey last week, than they did back in January. And that is, um, at least for now, one of the legacies of this is that Canadians are feeling better about, as I'll show you, uh, the government overall, as well as uh, the prime minister. And that may dissipate over time. Um, and as soon as the pandemic uh, starts to become less uh, a focus, but it has put a new lens on how people are, are evaluating both the federal and their provincial and, and municipal governments. This is our tracking of federal government approval. You saw the green line earlier in another chart, but you could see that prior to the election and even in the few months after the federal election last October, more Canadians disapproved of the federal government than approved. This wasn't a government that was particularly popular um, at any point over the last year um, and, you know, held on to a minority government, wasn't um, lost their majority in the last federal election. So this was a fairly divisive um, and, and increasingly polarized population. But the pandemic had the effect of bringing people together 
Um, we saw it in many other countries around the world, a rallying around the flag. And, and, and that has, has held out, although the government doesn't have anywhere near the approval ratings it was, it was getting back in May at 58%, which has you know, the highest it had ever um, uh, registered in our tracking over the last um, six years that this government's been in power. When we look at the, fe the, the federal leaders themselves, um, you know, Mr. Trudeau, the prime minister, remains relatively popular. About the same number have a positive view of him. The green boxes as, as view him negatively. That's generally better than he's been um, prior to the pandemic. Um, and again, that's, I think, a, a, he's, he's benefited from the leadership and, and sort of the crisis that the pandemic created. Um, our new conservative uh, leader, the opposition leader, Aaron O'Toole, um, was elected a few months ago in the summer, and um, he starts more or less even with about the same number of people viewing him positively or negatively, a much better position than the previous conservative leader, Andrew Scheer, who ended uh, being the most unpopular leader uh, in the country. But a lot of Canadians still don't know who and uh, Aaron O'Toole is. It's going to take time um, and maybe even a federal election before they really get to know him. Now, Mr. Singh uh, Jagmeet Singh is the new Democrat leader, um, and he right now is the more popular leader if you look at net favorables. More people like him than dislike him. Uh, he's had fairly positive numbers for, for quite some time and, um, you know, um, has benefited from that um, in terms of his ability to, 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 to support, um, to gain support and, 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 and lead this minority government um, and just last week propping it up and preventing an election. Now, one of the things we've asked Canadians last week is if there were an election today, there's lots of talk about a possible uh, election coming up, um, which of these issues would be most important in deciding your vote? And so we asked uh, six different items, having a plan and policies to deal with the pandemic, having a plan for the Canadian economy in the future, uh, finding the right balance in spending and taxation levels, helping create, uh, protect existing jobs and creating new jobs, combining, coming up with ideas to combat climate change and protect the environment and working to improve equality of all people in Canada. These were broad policy areas, but ways of framing uh, policy. And you can see that more Canadians, almost half, uh, say that having a plan and policies to help deal with the pandemic would be the most important factor in how they would vote in an election if it were held today. And everything else sort of falls out um, about equal with, with economic issues or fiscal issues uh, being more important, climate change only about 10% of Canadians, inequality at nine. But the important difference is how we compare cons liberals and conservatives, for example. When we look at those who voted liberal in the last federal election, it uh, looks similar to the national average, a little, uh, you know, 10 point higher among pandemic, but you can see these kind of economic fiscal issues fall um, somewhat lower uh, relative to the population as a whole. When we look at conservative voters, here we see a very different picture. And here's where you start to understand where Canadian politics is, is going and where it is today. While more conservative voters say a plan uh, to deal with the pandemic is their sort of top issue in deciding how to the vote, when you combine um, a plan for the economy or rights uh, balance of spending and taxation levels or, or protecting existing jobs, you can see you get a clear majority um, kind of piling into one of the more economic issues. And so for conservative oriented voters, um, the concern is far more about the economic consequences of the pandemic and getting the economy going. That's not surprising. That's what we normally would see, but it does show when you compare these two slides, um, the two worlds that almost exist in, in Canadian politics. And while we don't have a very highly polarized system, there is some polarization or some differences in how these voters will approach um, voting and how I think the parties would approach uh, an election if, if one were to come. Now, to talk of an election, we, we averted one last week um, around a confidence vote. Uh, there is no real desire for an election. If you ask Canadians, I, I actually think um, this was a survey we did um, uh, over the weekend. Um, I don't think there's very few moments in time when Canadians will be, you know, excited for an election or really want one. We typically see when, a, when an incumbent government is very, very unpopular, that might be the impetus to have an election. We don't see that. So conservatives um, are more likely to want an election, conservative voters than anybody else. But again, 
there doesn't appear to be any real desire for an election, particularly now. And, and we, we've seen a provincial election in Saskatchewan uh, yesterday, a BC election on the weekend, um, and, and evidence is that turnout dropped substantially in those elections, which is an indicator uh, either that the people are generally satisfied with their governments or um, there's not as much engagement because of the pandemic. So all this means, though, if we were to have an election, our latest polling shows a very close race, um, very much uh, in line with what we saw in the last election, actually. The Liberals would have a slight advantage uh, over the Conservatives naturally built on um, leads in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, the Conservatives do very well in the prairies. Um, and the New Democrats, I think, are getting slight, a slight boost in BC because of the success of the provincial government there, but are more or less holding their vote uh, about where they were uh, at the last election. So despite all uh, everything that's happened in the world in the last seven months, despite a pandemic, despite record unemployment, um, if an election were held today and a campaign could change many things, um, our early indicators is that it would end very, I think, very close to how it ended back in October in 2019. Now, I'll end with, I think, what I would assume most of us are going to be watching over the next week is what happens in uh, the United States with their election. Um, one of the things we've been tracking is how Canadians feel about it. It's important in terms of our, not only how our government and our economy runs, but also I think in how we evaluate ourselves, everything uh, or not everything, but a lot of what Canadians think about the world and how they view themselves is often done in contrast and in comparison to what's going on in the United States. And so when we asked, uh, this is again, data from this past weekend, when we asked Canadians, how do you feel about the two leading uh, candidates for president, the current president, Donald Trump and, and vice, former vice president, Joe Biden, you can see two very different perspectives. Donald Trump has, I would say, um, I can say with confidence, probably the most unpopular US president uh, that's ever uh, been in terms of how Canadians feel about it. There's been times when Canadians have not responded well to past US presidents. I think recently George W. Bush uh, wasn't viewed uh, particularly popular, particularly around the uh, war in Iraq. But you know we're close to 80% of Canadians di uh, dislike or, or have a negative view of the US president is I think a remarkable thing and has been this way for some time. What's, what's, what's interesting about these two results and you can see where, where Mr. Biden is, is if, if they were political leaders in Canada, Ms. Donald Trump would no doubt be the most unpopular leader in Canada, but, but Mr. Biden would actually be the most popular leader in Canada when we compare them to, to how we view our own political leaders. And Mr. Biden's numbers have slowly improved in Canada as Canadians have gotten to know him through our uh, attention to the US election. Um, what does this mean? Well, obviously Canadians are rooting for, for one of these gentlemen to win the election. If they could vote, uh, Canada would be one of the most democratic states in the United States. 75% of Canadians say they would vote for Joe Biden if they could. Uh, one out of four Canadians would vote for Donald Trump. So. Um, as we head towards this election, I think um, there's no doubt who Canadians want to win, who Canadians um, hope wins this election. But the, but the complications around how that election goes, the anxiety that it's created, uh, just the relative volatility and uncertainty that Donald Trump and the Trump administration has brought to Canada-US relations, I think has created a scenario where Canadians are, are looking for more stability, especially given the pandemic. And, uh, and so there's a lot of hope that uh, Joe Biden does, does emerge uh, victorious next week, is, is sworn in in January. But perhaps more worrisome for Canadians is the, what would happen if it's a really close election and the, the winner is it's uncertain for, for weeks, maybe months. Um, that's a scenario where, where Canadians feel very vulnerable um, to, to that kind of volatility. So I will end there and, and, and leave with just a few final thoughts. I think... Uh, as I've said, um, you know, it's been a, a really interesting period to, to measure uh, Canadian public opinion. Uh, over the last seven months, we've seen uh, views and attitudes uh, shift. Uh, we've seen a rise in, in, in fairly positive feelings about our, our political system. We've done some work with other organizations that showed, you know, trust in institutions are up, uh, feelings that, 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 
government and public institutions play an important role in people's lives have increased. Um, all that being said, you know, the second spike has created a, an immense amount of anxiety right now. Canadians are uncertain about what this is going to mean. They know that the economic consequences are severe. They're deeply concerned about the level of public uh, debt and deficits that governments are having to run up to, to help support people and businesses during this difficult time. And, and they don't know what the, you know, the, the road will bring and what, what we're going to do on the other end. Despite relatively uh, strong approval ratings for the federal government, when we ask people how they're actually going to would vote, um, it's far more competitive than it perhaps should be. I think this is perhaps lingering um, 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 partisanship and concerns about you know, Mr. Trudeau and ethics questions that have clouded this government even recently and might and almost brought the government down last week. Uh, but the two by-elections last night, I think, show that that these results that we're seeing are in line with what we would have expected those by-elections uh, to produce. Ultimately, you know, we're all looking to the U.S. and, and the U.S. election. And, and once we have clarity on what's going to happen, uh, I think Canadians then are going to be starting to shift into what recovery looks like. But recovery can't be part of our conversation until we really feel confident that the virus is under control. And right now, um, Canadians are increasingly unsure about whether that's happening. So um, I'll end there. It's been a, a pleasure to share. And um, if you have any questions beyond uh, this session, you can always reach out to me. My email's there, david at advocacydata.ca. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter as well. So thanks so much, Maureen. I'll, I'll hand things back to you. David, thank you very much for this um, really uh, interesting snapshot and your analysis of uh, where we are uh, as a country right now. And because with this presentation on what Canadians are thinking, David has set us up for our look at the second session of Canada's 43rd Parliament. So we are going to hear from the politicians, the representatives of Canada's three main political parties, and what their priorities are for this new session. But first, we're going to start off with a discussion on process, the workings of this hybrid minority pandemic parliament. Uh, we're fortunate to have the Speaker of the House of Commons to start us off. The Honourable Anthony Rota was elected the 37th Speaker by his peers last December. Late last week, I asked him how this new session is going to work. Hello, Maureen, and I, I just want to say beforehand, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and it's a pleasure to uh, greet everyone and welcome them to Canada. I'd say it's a, I'm hoping that their stay is a, is going to be a, the best one in their career, and I'm sure it will be. Of course, I'm a little bit biased on that one, but uh, you were asking about how the next session is going to work out. Uh, it's going to be interesting because uh, what the Parliament has decided on is a hybrid session, so we're limited to uh, a certain number in the House, and uh, any Anything over that uh, either uh, spills over into the uh, gallery uh, where we have spectators or uh, they go into their offices and they hook up by uh, by video conference, just like we're doing right now. And uh, the debates are there. What happens is the speaker uh, has to recognize that there are people at home. They are in their offices and uh, they are participating. So you've got the people in the house and you've got the people in their own office or their own house. And uh, we're using Zoom as the platform for that, uh, just like we're doing right now. Uh, people will make statements. Uh, they will uh, present motions. They'll have uh, statements by ministers. Question period happens that way as well. People calling in from home or people being in the house. And it really works out well because the responses don't only come from people in the house. They also come from people who are in their offices or uh, away from Parliament, uh, which really creates uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, situation. But overall, it seems to be working very well. Uh, I know with the G7, we've had regular talks amongst the speakers, and I've had uh, speeches with or uh, discussions with many uh, speakers from around the world. Uh, and we exchange information. And uh, if uh, someone makes a mistake, we tell the other one uh, so that they don't make the same mistake and best practices go from there. So it has been working out very well. I just want to turn to your role with the diplomatic community. Normally, the speaker plays a role. Um, is that on pause, given the need for social distancing, or, or how do you maintain maintain ties? 
You know what? That, that's probably the part that I was worried about the most because uh, I really do enjoy the the visits and the phone calls. Unfortunately, the visits don't still take place, but uh, on a regular basis, either a phone call or a uh, uh, a video conference takes place, and uh, I invite all the new uh, ambassadors and uh, to uh, give me a call and uh, let's set something up. I think it's important that we keep that uh, diplomatic dialogue going so that we know what's going on, not only in Canada. Canada, but between Canada and their countries. And that's something that I plan on keeping very much alive. And we are doing uh, maybe not as often as we did before, but uh, by all means, uh, please uh, keep that uh, door open. My door is always open. And, uh, or should I say, my, uh, my connection is always open to, uh, <laughs> to a Zoom conference uh, if they wish, or if they're more comfortable with the phone, that's okay. And overall, uh, it's been working out very well. So I'm very pleased. So no, the, uh, the diplomatic uh, part of the speaker's job is not on hold. It continues, and uh, hopefully uh, it'll expand even more. Thanks to the speaker. Uh, now the speaker is supported by his team of table officers. They're the clerks and officials who make parliament work. Since March, they've been grappling with how to run a pandemic parliament. Andre Gagnon has been vital in this role. He's the deputy clerk procedure for the House of Commons. And I invited him to talk about what it's been like. We've been talking for virtual parliaments for years much before the pandemic, but in this specific case is to make a virtual parliament while we are in a pandemic situation. So that doubles, I would say, the uh, the, the, the difficulty. Add to this, not a small thing, uh, being in a minority uh, government. So that's a very, very interesting challenge. But the fact that we are operating virtual in a during a minor during a pandemic situation makes it that the first priority should be the health and safety of the employees the members of parliament and the staff of the uh, of the um, of the uh, the members so that that, that re rebalances a, a lot of the issues and the question that we were grappling with over the years to make sure that we would eventually get to some part at least of a virtual parliament and in fact, what we what we found very, very rapidly is that, yes, virtual parliament is a goal, but clearly going hybrid is a, clearly the first step to do so. And why is that? It's because hybrid permits us to permits the members of parliament to have a kind of a step between going uh, fully, fully virtual because conventions and practices have been there for a long, long time and they're quite useful and members see why they are useful and also uh, are attached to those uh, practices because they it gives them a sense of how proceedings work. So having a hybrid parliament has been kind of a step towards getting to a virtual parliament. When members started to talk about virtual parliament, they were getting back to the basics of saying the government should be accountable in front should be accountable to the house, to parliament, to a legislative assembly, which is essentially the basic of what is a parliament. And also one of the big things we've noticed that this country, well, we've, we're, we were reminded that this country is huge. And the fact that if you want members to participate virtually from one side of the country to the other, well, there's a major difference simply in time zones. There's four time zones in Canada. So when you organize a meeting at eight in the morning, there are, there are issues for certain members of parliament. So we had to adjust that significantly. So just ad adjusting this made that the Ottawa zone was much larger and expanded in terms of possibilities for members of parliament to, to meet virtually. Minority governments are very exciting for uh, procedural nerds like me, procedural geeks like me. And that's why we dress like this because we're very special in procedural <laughs> procedural uh, grounds. And uh, I would say uh, just a minority government is a very uh, different situation. We don't have that much of minority governments in, in Canada. Our traditions don't go exactly in that in in that direction for instance you don't hear much about coalitions in canada whereas in other countries where there are minority governments there are coalitions so there is a challenge there for as you can imagine for the government but for the other parties as well and for us in parliament in the sense that 
there is always the issue of the confidence convention, which is essentially we are in a situation where the government could essentially be defeated in the House, lose the confidence of the House. So in just in and of, it, of itself, sorry, uh, this question is a big one. And whenever we are in a minority government situation, this is a, an issue we have to work with and make sure that we work, we organize the work of the House properly so that there are no issues or discussions regarding the validity of a vote. You can imagine that is increased significantly when you get into a minority government with a virtual or a hybrid parliament. And that's why you saw during the proceedings of the committee that studied the issue of electronic voting, electronic parliament or a hybrid parliament, the issue of voting was central in there. You can imagine it would be difficult to have a situation where there would be a vote and the way the vote was organized, conducted, would be discussed. As you can imagine, this would be a, an important issue. Just having the government losing, for instance, on a vote that would be contested is a big question for the employees of parliament and as you can imagine, for the speaker. So the minority and uh, the virtual hybrid parliament, there are those two things together. There's a next, I would say a level, more important level of complexity and certain, certainly of responsibility. For those who want to take a look at how parliament is evolving into a government, a minority government situation, you need to take a close look at what's happening in committees. And as, well, as, well, as you had you've probably noticed since the beginning of this new session, there is a lot of action in committees. The different committees that have met, I've already started to discuss their plans for the future for uh, next weeks and they have a very very ambitious program and that's where a lot of the action takes place so some good advice for understanding the confidence convention and to follow what goes on in committee you will all know that the government avoided defeat on a confidence vote last week, a vote that would have triggered an election, uh, and we can expect more votes. Um, we also thank Andre Gagnon for preparing a presentation on understanding how Parliament works. It's up on our website, as well as an information sheet prepared by the Library of Parliament, carlton.ca slash parldiplo. And a reminder, we're at parldiplo on Twitter. We look forward to your comments. And now we will pivot to hearing some voices from Parliament. I'm going to ask three distinguished members of Parliament to join the conversation. The Honourable Catherine McKenna serves as Minister of Infrastructure and Communities after previously serving as Minister for the Environment. She represents Ottawa Centre. Uh, she will be joined shortly by the Honourable Michael Chong, the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs for the Official Opposition. He served as Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and Sport and President of the Queen's Privy Council in the government of Stephen Harper. Mr. Chong represents the Southern Ontario riding of Wellington Halton Hills. Heather McPherson represents Edmonton Strathcona. She's the only NDP, in fact, the only non-conservative MP from uh, Alberta. She's the NDP critic for international development, the deputy critic for foreign affairs and the deputy house leader. We are going to discuss foreign policy, but first I want to turn to Minister McKenna, as there was a clear focus on domestic affairs in the speech from the throne. Minister, M Minister McKenna, you are responsible for infrastructure. How is that going to fit into COVID recovery and Canadian competitiveness? Uh, well, thanks very much, Maureen. Uh, it's great to uh, be speaking with you, but also to all the diplomats. So uh, a big hello, uh, bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, I, you know, once uh, I worked in Indonesia and uh, I saw the important role that diplomats play. Um, so thank you very much. And I, I'm sure, you know, you're very interested. I, I heard a bit about what Anthony Rhoda was saying about a minority parliament. So get ready for a ride. Um, I'm also really happy, actually, to be joined by two of my colleagues. You'll see a lot of fighting in parliament. I have a great deal of respect. Um, for both Michael Chong, who I've known for an extremely long time, uh, as well as Heather McPherson. So, um, look, I thought I would briefly speak about a few things. Um, one, uh, the speech from the throne, two, infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, and three, foreign policy. I know those are extremely big topics, so I will be short. 
Um, but I think it's important to really understand uh, what is our what is the perspective of our government uh, on these issues. Um, so first of all, uh, the speech from the throne. This throne. Um, I think the prime minister made it clear uh, that our number one priority, uh, like all, I assume governments around the world, your governments, um, is on the pandemic response. Um, we are still uh, in the throes of a pandemic. Uh, we're seeing a second wave in many places across the country. And our focus has been from the start, how do we how do we ensure that we're responding to a health crisis, but also very much an economic economic crisis? So the speech on the throne talked a lot about what we're doing to support uh, provinces, including on testing, testing, tracing data. Uh, clearly, vaccine is really important. Um, so all of those measures, and we've been making those investments. So around 80 to 90 cents of every dollar that's being invested on the COVID response is coming from the federal government. Luckily, we're in a very good fiscal uh, position to do so. Um, and our focus has really been uh, how do we support folks through the pandemic? And that's through a whole bunch of different programs um, from the wage subsidy uh, to uh, supports to businesses, to supports to individuals, to supports to particular communities like the black community. You'll also see in the speech from the throne, uh, there was a big discussion of inclusivity. So we have a number, uh, as I like to say it, we have a number of different things that are coming. Pandemics are happening at the same time, obviously COVID, which is health and economic. Um, we also have, uh, I think, a, a recognition that uh, we have some real challenges when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Um, and systemic discrimination is real. Uh, I see it actually every day, including through my infrastructure programs, which I'm happy one day to talk about that in more detail. So really focused on how do we support racialized communities? How do we support indigenous communities? How do we ensure that everyone succeeds across the country? Um, and then the third thing is the economic uh, response. And that's uh, where I really see in my portfolio that uh, I have a really important role. Uh, infrastructure has a really important role to play. We talked about a million jobs, and I think this is what we need to be doing. We need to be putting the economic response, including climate, which is a real economic opportunity in a million jobs frame. So uh, that will come to my second part. So infrastructure. Uh, when I came into this job, boy, it seems like it's hard to believe there was a time before the pandemic, but there was. Uh, my focus was on getting projects built quickly um, to create jobs uh, across the country and improve the quality of life. Uh, two, to make sure that we're moving to a cleaner and more resilient future. And three, inclusivity, to make sure that we're making investments that benefit all Canadians. Um, I should have mentioned actually in the speech from the throne, there was a big focus on uh, inclusivity in terms of women. So uh, one thing I do not wanna lose this that we've seen when you look at stats about how the pandemic has hurt folks, 63% uh, uh, of the job losses were with uh, were women. Um, so investments clearly in um, early learning and childcare are critically important. I'm a mom. Uh, I've tried to juggle like trying to, you know, homeschool, you know, make sure my kids are doing school actually and not just video games, they're older. Um, but uh, while trying to do my job, while trying to maintain my home, it's very hard. Um, and there are women that are in much less privileged positions than me. So I think that's important. And so certainly part of infrastructure will be childcare. But on the infrastructure pieces that, that really are my focus, um, it uh, really has to be seen through a climate lens. Um, I think that that is critically important. So what we build, we're building for the next often 50, uh, 50 or more years. And we've committed as a government to net zero by 2050. So it was key in the speech from the throne, but just generally that climate is gonna be critical uh, to how we think about a million jobs um, and infrastructure is obviously a really important part. So things that are, uh, you know, you can, you can probably expect. Um, Obviously, retrofits, huge opportunity, job opportunity, but also uh, it's a huge opportunity um, to for people to save money. So I think we need to talk about that. You can create jobs. You can also save money. You can get a cleaner future. Uh, and you can do it across the country in communities across the country. Um, clean energy, uh, transmission lines between provinces. You may not know um, that Canada is 80% clean electricity. That is one of the top in the world. Uh, we wanna be 90% or higher clean electricity. We have some provinces that are on coal. Uh, we need to get off coal. And for province, for countries that are thinking about how do you do this? Cause obviously there are jobs issues. 
you need to be making sure that you have a just transition for communities. We've worked hard when I was previously environment minister. We had one of the first just transition uh, committees in the world where we went to communities that were on coal, where we're literally phasing out coal, phasing out jobs and figuring out how are we going to work with them, provide the support to workers, but also to communities including investments in infrastructure so that they can build a cleaner future, but also have good jobs. Um, uh, zero emission vehicles and public transit, extremely important. Uh, many of our a significant chunk of our emissions uh, come from the transportation sector. So we clearly need to be uh, doing a lot more work there. Um, a clean technologies, I see the huge opportunity every day for Canada. So I want us to be the most competitive country in the world. Uh, we're already punching above our weight when it comes to clean technologies, but I think that there's a lot more we can do through the supply chain. Um, I'm originally from Hamilton, if you don't know where Hamilton is, I call it the hammer. Uh, it is a you know manufacturing uh, town, um, had suffered job losses, but there's opportunities there in the automotive sector. But even when we do manufacturing, how do we be the cleanest producer? Because um, that's gonna be an advantage um, for sure in the future. So let's take now foreign policy. Um, look, I think is an overarching, uh, message, we believe in multilateralism and rules-based systems. That is the bottom line, that it, they are under threat right now. Uh, we've seen that uh, around the world, and we need to be working together. Um, you take climate change. Um, it, climate change knows no boundaries. Pollution knows no boundaries. We absolutely need to be working together. That's why we work so hard to uh, play a role um, in getting an ambitious Paris Agreement, um, and we all have to do our part. Um, Minister the Kenna, I want to ask you to stop there. Yep. Um, you've given us a lot to unpack. I okay, want to give sorry. You an opportunity to speak as well. And I'm going okay, to sure. ask Michael Wong a question. Uh, Michael, actually, I was going to um, start on some foreign policy by you know, recognizing there was no emphasis on uh, foreign policy in the speech from the throne. But would you rather have a, a react to um, what Minister McKenna was saying about uh, about domestic policy? Your choice. Sure. Um, the four, you're right. Uh, well, thank you, First Marine, for inviting me and uh, my colleague, Minister McKenna and MP McPherson, to be on this uh, on this Zoom chat. Uh, I've known uh, Minister McKenna for many years, back to her time at U of T. So it's great to hear her again. Uh, you're right, Maureen, that uh, there was scant reference to um, foreign policy in the speech from the throne, but the, the speech from the throne did acknowledge uh, climate change. And I think that's a good starting point. I think our view is that uh, there's a yawning gap between rhetoric and reality that uh, has come from this government. And climate change is a good example of that. Uh, the speech from the throne not only committed to meeting Canada's Paris commitments, its Paris target, uh, but in fact to exceed it. And if you look at the data, it's simply not happening. Um, the government, on the government's own data, climate uh, emissions from climate emissions in Canada have been rising. They've been in 2016, the first full year that this government was in office, they were 708 megatons uh, during April the government released the most recent year for which they have data, which is 2018, and emissions have risen to 729 megatons, a big jump of some 21 megatons. So emissions in Canada are increasing, not decreasing. So we are actually moving further away from our Paris targets. And so for the government to assert in the speech on the throne that it's not only going to meet the Paris targets, but exceed them defies reality. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Minister Freeland, when she was Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, several years ago, uh, really sketched out the government's foreign policy. And I think it touches on domestic policy because in that speech, which is the, the framework, the strategy for the government's foreign policy, she outlined two challenges that the uh, gov that two, the two big challenges in global affairs. One being, uh, one of those two big challenges is the rise of populism and its attendant distrust of uh, the global economy. And Minister Freeland at the time outlined that the solution to that problem is the government's economic agenda. 
So we now have some five years to evaluate that agenda, and our view is that it's not working. Uh, if you look at the IMF uh, reports that are coming out, the World Bank reports, the OECD reports, it's clear that going into the pandemic, we were in trouble on a per capita basis. We were in a recession for the last year and a half on uh, negative GDP or flatline GDP. Um, and now in the pandemic, our recession is going to be far deeper than many of our economic peers and our recovery much slower. In fact, we have the highest unemployment rate in the G7. Uh, and we have uh, many other issues as well, uh, record high levels uh, in global standing of household indebtedness. Uh, we have uh, problems with the regulation of our uh, natural resource sector, um, and I could go on. But the point I'm making is that domestic and foreign policy are intertwined. And when you look at the domestic policy elements of the government's agenda, uh, they don't back up its foreign policy. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to turn to Heather McPherson. Welcome, uh, MP McPherson. Um, in this pandemic minority parliament, the Trudeau government needs your party's support to stay in power. Um, I, because we have an, an audience of diplomats, I'm going to ask you, is there one NDP foreign policy priority? No, I guess is the easy answer. Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for um, inviting me and for um, letting me attend the 10th annual Day for Diplomats. It's wonderful to be here with my colleagues. Um, as, as 2020 is, we're all joining online instead of being able to be, be in person. Um, when you ask if there is one um, foreign, foreign policy that, that is a priority for us, no, there's, there's a whole bunch of, of priorities. Um, I am the, the deputy foreign affairs critic. I'm also the international development critic. I've also spent over 20 years prior to being in the house, being elected in, in October, um, working in sustainable development and international development and foreign affairs issues. So, so to, to sort of summarize it as one issue is, is really, really challenging for us. Um, I will say that what I, what I was hearing from Michael and, and really resonates with me in that we are hearing a lot of the right things from this particular government. We often hear the right things, but but we have not seen, you know, the the, the equal action on the other side. The the words that we heard from the prime minister in 2015 when he was elected were perfect. They were wonderful. Canada's back. We're going to be a leader in climate change. We're going to recommit to Canada's place in the world. We're going to do all of these things. We're really deeply committed to multilateralism, to rule-based order. We're going to commit to increasing our ODA. All of these things were part of this, this, these promises, and none of that has resulted in action. And so that's, for us, a big part of it. Um, for New Democrats, our priorities, of course, are going to include things like nuclear disarmament. You know, this week, we actually signed, there was the 50 countries that ratified the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibi Prohibition of Nuclear um, Armaments. This is a big deal. And Canada is not there. We've fallen off. We've, you know, we're, we're not where we used to be. We're not playing that role in the world. Um, we need to recommit to peacekeeping. We have a, a fraction of the of the peacekeepers out in the field that we should have. We need to be committing to making sure that our weapons aren't being used to to fuel conflict in places like Yemen, in places like Turkey. And we we can't say that right now. That's that's not what's happening. Um, we need to do more in Israel and Palestine. There's there's so many things we need to do. Um, our ODA is at the worst level it's been in over 50 years, and there's no plan on getting us to a better place for our ODA. Uh, that's that's unconscionable for a country like Canada in the middle of a global health pandemic. I, I mean, I can keep going, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Great. Well, we're we're going to give you more of a chance to to come back and talk some more. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Minister McKenna again because we're talking about um, you know the world changing and obviously the U.S. role in the world has changed over the last four years. Uh, uh, you know, an abdication of leadership in, on certain issues. Regardless of who wins next week's election, how should Canada be reacting to that changed role? Uh, look, I'll give you a practical example. I mean, there's a lot I can say. I have a great deal with my colleagues, but uh, and I don't have time for a rebuttal. But I would say that we uh, are taking serious action on climate change. I mean, look, the Conservatives actually fought the last election um, on a price on pollution, and we won. 
Uh, the election was won by parties that supported a price on pollution and ambitious climate action. The reason it was so hard to take action on climate was we had a government, uh, the Harper government, who didn't really believe in any action on climate. It's great to have a target if you don't actually deliver on your target with clear plan. We had the first plan ever. Do we have more work to do? Absolutely. But we bent the curve two thirds, uh, reducing our emissions by two thirds. When you look out to 2030, your emission reductions don't happen the year after you come in after a government has done nothing. But Internationally, as an example, though, um, look, I think Canada has to figure out where it can play a role. So when Donald Trump said he was pulling out of the Paris Agreement, what did we do? I thought, OK, this is a real problem because we just signed a Paris Agreement and we need to maintain momentum. So I went um, to uh, to Berlin. I met with my counterpart um, from the EU, uh, as well as my counterpart from China. And yes, we have an absolutely have a, a very challenging relationship with China and China absolutely needs to uh, release uh, the two Michaels, um, that it's unacceptable. But we did at that time, uh, we're working well with China and climate, which is really important because they're a major, uh, they are the biggest emitter. And we decided that in the face of the U.S. pulling out, we were going to work together. Um, we created the Ministerial on Climate Action. We brought together major economies, developed and developing economies around the world. And that was because Canada decided we had a role to play. And we used our good offices to bring folks together because people were very skeptical. <laughs> you and China, I think they were like, who is this Catherine McKenna? Why does Canada think it can do this? And that played an important role uh, in maintaining momentum, uh, that you've seen the same thing that Minister Freeland, when she was Minister of Foreign Affairs on Venezuela, on a whole range of different issues, that we looked at where can Canada make a real difference in the world? Um, we're always going to stand up for multilateralism and rules-based order because that's in our interest. And I think that values and interests, that's what foreign policy has to be about. What do we believe in as a country and where are our interests? Now, and let's talk a bit about the U.S. Obviously, I'm not going to speculate on the election at all, but I mean, they are our friends. They are our largest trading partner. We do need to work with them. We spent a significant amount of time across party lines, across levels of government with business renegotiating NAFTA because we needed to do that. It's just so incredibly important to our economy. Do we need to diversify? Of course, but we have to work with the economy that's right beside us and uh, where we have very significant ties. So we'll continue to do that. I mean, obviously, it's been a very challenging four years. I think that that goes without saying. But you just have to be pragmatic, one foot in front of the other. And then you still have to stand up for the issues you believe in. Um, that's very much climate change. Um, but it's also multilateralism, rules-based order. We've we've been working very hard uh, to get the WTO working better. Um, that's critically important. You've seen the appointment of Bob Ray. I, I can't imagine a better ambassador to the United Nations. Um, I think he's been very blunt, which I think is good uh, in foreign policy. Sometimes people don't like that. That's my, my uh, you know, you have to sometimes be blunt and uh, be very clear um, on what we see our vision for uh, the world, also what our interests are and what our values are and what we expect in our relationships with other countries. So, look, we're going to continue doing what we're doing um, and you adjust. You don't get to choose who your uh, who you work with. We don't, that the Americans will decide the outcome of their election and we will work with whomever's there, um, but we will continue to promote Canadian values and interests. Thank you, Catherine McKenna. Now, um, Michael, um, Mr. McKenna raised a number of issues, including the detention of, in China of the two Michaels. You have been critical of the government's handling and I invite you to discuss that, but I also want to know if you've been surprised by the lack of support from our allies. I'm not at all surprised by the lack of support from our allies because it's not clear to our allies nor to Canadians what the government's China policy is. And they've implicitly acknowledged that, that it's broken uh, because they've announced uh, for some time now that they're coming forward with a new China policy. Uh, we await with bated breath what that looks like. I think the part, I think the heart of the problem with the government's China policy is that it has been inconsistent and incoherent. I'll just highlight a few examples. Uh, just after the, the two Michaels, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, were wrongfully detained by the Chinese authorities in December of 2018, just six weeks after that, the government gave two very contradictory messages. 
the prime minister indicated that uh, there was no way that we were looking at trading uh, Meng Wanzhou for the two Michaels, that there was no way that they were going to interfere with uh, due process and procedural fairness in our judicial system. And then in the very same week, we had the Canadian ambassador to China, um, the Honorable John McCallum, uh, saying quite the opposite on two different occasions. Uh, the ambassador was replaced and we still have contradictions. Last uh, July, for example, the foreign minister indicated that the government was looking, he told the House of Commons, the government was looking, considering sanctions on Chinese officials. And then the very next day, uh, the government told Reuters that that was off the table. Uh, just several weeks ago, we had the foreign minister tell the Globe and Mail that Canada was abandoning the pursuit of free trade talks with China. On the very same day, we have the Canadian ambassador to China, Dominic Barton, telling an audience in Edmonton, including the Chinese ambassador to Canada, that Canada needs to be in China, that we need to expand our presence there and do more trade with China. So these are just several of the examples, many examples of inconsistency and incoherence on China. So I'm not at all surprised that our allies haven't stood up to support us because it's pretty confusing to figure out what our policy is. Look, we believe that we need to be consistent, coherent with China. We believe we need to del deliver a clear message and the clear message is simply this, that we're no longer going to put up with these shenanigans and that we're going to take a much stronger stand in defense of our, not just our values, but our hard interests. And we're gonna back it up with some hard decisions and hard action. Um, so we will be unveiling that as we go forward, um, but we believe that that is the way to deal with uh, the threat that China has presented to our interests and to our values. Uh, thank you, Michael. And, and now I'm going to pivot slightly from that and uh, ask Heather McPherson, uh, um, you referred to the federal government spending well below the UN target for foreign international assistance. Uh, yet in the last election, the conservatives proposed spending even less, a 25% cut uh, to the levels. How can your party channel public support for increased spending for democratic governance, aid and assistance? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great question. And and actually, if you look at the numbers, it's it's what the conservatives were proposing is actually closer to 35 percent um, cut for foreign aid. It's it's absolutely absurd. Um, one of the things that that I think in terms of, of how we can get Canadians engaged and how we can we can support this this contribution, this investment in our international development um, is really working with Canadians and working with Canadians across the country, not just in Ottawa, not just in Toronto, Montreal. Um, what we saw over the last 10 years, particularly in the Harper years, but, but continuing on, is a real decimation of our, of our public engagement. So we weren't talking to people about Canada's role in the world. We weren't talking to people about what it means to be a good global citizen. And, and that meant that people didn't care about it anymore. Uh, we decimated our funding. We stopped funding organizations across the country. So instead of funding organizations in every province, we started funding the World Bank because uh, it's easier to write one check than actually do the work to engage with stakeholders across the country. Um, and so it stopped being something that Canadians cared about. But when you think about our identity, Canada's identity, uh, you, you still see that Canadians see ourselves as punching above our weight on the world stage. It's just not the reality anymore because our government has abdicated that role. Uh, and, and I'm, and I'm, you know, livid with the Liberals for doing so little and promising so much. But don't get me wrong, the Conservatives before them is where these deep, deep cuts started. Um, so, so all of that together means that, I mean, that's how we get, we get Canadians engaged. This is also, COVID-19 gives us also this sort of silver lining opportunity because people are seeing that our, our challenges facing humanity are more and more global in nature. You know, the climate crisis is global in nature. It doesn't recognize um, borders. The, the economic crisis that we're in right now is global in nature. And, and we are in the ultimate sort of global situation, a global health pandemic. So there's been polling done in the US, there's been polling 
polling done in Canada that shows that Canadians are starting to really recognize that we need to have global solutions. We need to be, we need to be playing a role in the world stage. We need to have um, a better multilateral relationship and bilateral relationships with countries around the world. We need to invest in those relationships. And we haven't been doing the work that needs to be done. And, and we're going to get left behind if we don't. Canadians see it. Uh, we just need the government to act on it. Okay, I just want one quick go around from everybody. Um, we, earlier this morning, David Coletto gave us a great presentation on Canadian public opinion and Canadian public opinion is clearly against holding an election right now. Um, Heather McPherson, what would make the NDP decide to vote against the government and trigger an election? You know, from, from my perspective, I was thinking about this question and from my perspective, I think if we saw the government continue there's, there's a few things. First of all, if we saw the government pivot to sort of that narrative that we're hearing out of the conservative side of the house, the, that austerity, that, that, that going into an austerity sort of agenda, uh, that would be really problematic for us. I mean, our priority has been making sure that Canadian families, Canadian businesses, individuals are helped as we go through this, this crisis. Uh, so that would be an issue. Um, but the other thing is, and, and Michael alluded to this earlier, you know, the throne speech had a lot of great things in it. And they had a lot of things that we want to see. We want to see childcare. We think that's a fundamental piece of an economic recovery for this country. We want to see pharmacare. It's time. It's been promised for years and years. It's time. Um, you know, we need to see a green recovery. I'm Albertan. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the economy in my province and jobs in my province in free fall. And they were in free fall before COVID-19 happened. So, so I need to see that the government isn't just going to make these promises, that they're actually going to do this, the work that needs to happen. Um, and as long as we can keep providing the support that Canadians need in the middle of a global pandemic, then we'll keep doing that. Uh, but when when the ethics issues become too much, when we see the rhetoric out stripping the actual work getting done. Uh, and when we see the, the Liberals trying to sort of grab onto that austerity piece, uh, that's those are gonna be really problematic for me. Thank you. Um, Michael Chong, question to you. It's certainly um, the Conservatives have been prepared to vote to bring down the government, but if you look at uh, uh, what's been going on, governments that have called an election during a pandemic have been rewarded with the majority. So. Um, do you want to comment on that? Sure. Well, thanks, Maureen, for having us uh, before we, we sign off. Um, look, I, I'll, I, don't disagree, I don't agree with uh, saying that we voted to take down the government. We don't want to have a fall election. We voted to create a parliamentary committee. Uh, the government decided that for the first time since Confederation, the establishment of a parliamentary committee uh, would constitute reasons to trigger a federal election. So that's what happened last week. Uh, look, there's only one person in this country that's going to decide to have a federal election, and that's the prime minister, either because he declares something, a vote of confidence uh, as an excuse to go to Rideau Hall and seek dissolution of parliament, or because he, he just goes to Rideau Hall and seeks dissolution. Um, so we don't want to have a fall election. We think it's better to wait uh, until uh, sometime next year. Um, but that's, I think the government is looking at the elections in British Columbia, in Saskatchewan, in New Brunswick, and looking at its chops. I think they really want to go this fall. And so we are doing everything we can to work constructively in Parliament. Uh, and I don't think the establishment of a new parliamentary committee um, is reasons to go to a federal election. But I'll just I'll just finish by saying this that look I think the government back to foreign policy I I think the government has you know had some foreign policy accomplishments to be fair they've concluded a number of trade agreements um, albeit so many of them started by the previous government um, but I think the reality is is that the world has changed significantly and Canada is in real trouble and I don't believe that the current government's approach to either domestic or foreign policy is going to address. Uh, the crisis that we are facing as a country. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a very personal story. My my father was born and raised in Hong Kong and was a Chinese immigrant to Canada. And my mother was born and raised in the Netherlands and she was a, a Dutch immigrant to Canada. And when my parents left their respective homelands in the 1950s and 60s to come to Canada, they were leaving much poorer, more impoverished places that to come to a land of wealth and plenty. That no longer is the case. 
Canada's per capita GDP now lags that of Hong Kong, lags that of the Netherlands. Our government debt is far higher. Our productivity is far lower. In, in, in short, we are in trouble. And we need a government, uh, both in domestic and foreign policy, that wakes up to this reality, that undertakes the structural reforms needed to get our economy moving, and also matches our rhetoric on the global stage with hard power. And if we don't, I think we're going to con continue to be buffeted by events in a very turbulent world, and we're going to continue our drift sideways, if not downward. And so I just want to put that out there because I think we really have some hard choices coming ahead that future governments are going to have to take to address this issue. Okay, thank you, Michael. And um, Catherine, your, your personal opinion on an election. Look, I'm just here to, I got into politics to get things done. Uh, I don't think Canadians want an election. I don't want an election. Our government doesn't want an election. We want to support Canadians through a pandemic. That is what we have been 100% focused on. That's the health pandemic. That's the economic crisis. And I, I just want to respond a bit to what uh, my honorable colleague, Michael Chong, said. Uh, I also have a story. My dad came from Dublin over 50 years ago because um, there was much more opportunity here. We're still the land of opportunity. Um, I think most people would be pretty happy. Uh, most Canadians are, are, are pretty happy to live in Canada. I think they're pretty proud about how our country has come together through COVID-19. Sure, our government's played a role, but working with other levels of government, working with the private sector. Um, and, uh, you know, we've we've brought in a whole lot of immigrants. If you look at studies in the world and refugees, if you look at studies in the world stage, Canada is the most welcoming country. Canadians believe in bringing in people. Uh, is there more work to do? A hundred percent. But on the international front, because I, we're, we're talking to a bunch of diplomats, I'm not going to make any apologies for our, our stand in the world stage. We have we're the only country that has trade agreements uh, with almost everyone. You look at who we have trade agreements with the largest trading partner in, in the largest um, economy in the world, the U.S., um, that we're part of, uh, we managed to get CETA. Uh, yeah, getting across the finish line is is more than just negotiating. That's a big deal. Um, that when you look at, um, you know, being part of uh, an Asian bloc, like we we actually have done a lot on the trade side, on the rules based order and multilateralism. That matters. You cannot go it alone if you're a country the size of Canada. I totally believe in in international development. We've done a lot, but I agree with Heather. I believe that personally believe we need to do more. I started a, a charity that did international development work after working for a UN peacekeeping mission in East Timor. So, uh, but I think we've played a really important role um, in a lot of different places around the world where you need to hear voices like Canada working with others. We all need to work together. And on climate, that is the biggest issue because it's not just a, a, a it's not just a, a, an environmental issue, it's an economic issue. And for, for a lot of the countries that are probably listening in, I mean, it's actually your survival that, you know, if we don't actually take serious action on climate change, there are many countries that will be underwater, that we'll have climate refugees, um, that we need to be working together the same way we have to work, uh, you know, to support different countries and, you know, work together in the pandemic response. We have to do that on climate change. And that's what we're going to continue to do. So look, I think that that's what I wake up to do every day is to make a difference in the lives of Canadians, um, including the folks who live in Ottawa Centre. So many of you may live in Ottawa Centre. Um, and I think that we need to get through the pandemic absolutely and support Canadians. And that's what we're focused on doing. Uh, and then we need to build back better. And we need to continue our ambition on climate change. Uh, we need to expand uh, to continue our, our role in the world working with our major partner in the south of the border, whoever is elected, um, but working with all the countries that are, you know, around the world. That is incredibly important, and it can be very challenging in different countries. There are different uh, issues, but overall, uh, I think that we see that Canada has a constructive role to play. Anyway, that's what gets me up every day. I'm going to continue working there, and I do want to thank uh, all the diplomats that, you know, I often don't have a chance. I, I don't go to a lot of events. I guess no one goes to events except for by Zoom, um, but I do want to thank you for the work you're doing. Um, I think it is really important. And thank, thank you, you, Carlton, of thank course, you. in my riding for hosting this. <laughs> Sorry, yes, uh, Ottawa Center is the in the, the writing for Carleton University. Thank you, Catherine <laughs> McKenna. Thank you, Michael Chong.
Thank you, Heather McPherson, for, for um, us. Your, giving us your time and your insights and uh, a wonderful discussion. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Marie, for having we're us. we're going to look at... Oh, thank you, Mike. Oh, yeah, thank you, Heather. Bye. <laughs> thank you, Mr. McKenna. Thank you, Pete McPherson. Bye-bye. Uh, and now we're going to look at ways of engaging with Parliament and parliamentarians. There are a lot of non-governmental organizations that focus on foreign policy and liaise with the diplomatic community, including the Canadian Global Affairs Institute and the Canadian International Council, to name just two. Uh, they're listed in the information sheet on the website. One organization is also connected to Parliament it's called the Parliamentary Center, and its mission is to support and strengthen democratic institutions. Its new CEO, Tom Cormier, is a Carleton graduate. He's a democratic governance expert with over 30 years of experience in over 30 countries. I've asked Tom to tell you about the Parliamentary Center and how you can engage. Thank you, Maureen. And it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning and to tend to share with you uh, the story about the Parliamentary Centre. Uh, Parliamentary Centre is Canada's oldest organization that works to support uh, democratic development uh, in the world. And it was born in 1968, interestingly, not with an international mandate, but with a domestic one. We started um, to provide support to the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Commons when it needed uh, research and uh, support to do its work more effectively. This was before uh, the strengthening of the Library of Parliament and the committee staff that we see now today. Since 1993, we've had a global mandate. And since that time, we've worked in over 120 legislatures at all levels of government across 70 countries in Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. And we do our work through experience sharing, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, consultations, training, developing tools and manuals, and uh, always supporting SDGs and other shared commitments where we find common ground. We believe really uh, strongly that effective legislatures are key to resolving all policy challenges in society and also all uh, divisions uh, in society that may exist. We think that parliaments that are more gender equal, that they're more inclusive, lead to more peaceful uh, and prosperous and secure societies. Parliaments and legislatures can take action on important public policy issues like education, healthcare, the environment, natural resources, trade and economic development. And without effective legislatures, oftentimes these important priorities uh, go unaddressed. We also undertake research, we promote dialogue and we in engage in partnerships and, and building networks to help people talk about democracy and its challenges, but also its opportunities. We look at issues about uh, of such as anti-corruption, oversight of, of budgets, uh, engagements of citizens and parliaments, um, and also looking to uh, increase the research capacity of parliaments. There are three nons to remember about our organization. We are nonpartisan in that we have representation of all political parties on our board and in the work that we do. We are non-prescriptive in that we don't come with answers. We come rather with a cafeteria of experiences and, and uh, options for people to explore, and we are nonprofit. Our main focus of work is in democratic institutions and with the actors that serve uh, in them. And that is obviously legislatures. We look at uh, how they can become more accountable institutions and how they can become more inclusive. Obviously that involves um, encouraging and making uh, legislatures more, uh, more of a better home for women and marginalized groups. We look at the three main functions of legislatures, that is lawmaking, budget, and representation functions, we, and we seek to strengthen those. We also look a lot at the plumbing issues in parliaments in terms of the internal organization and procedures, how they plan, and how they can improve their services to members, primarily through research and support to, to the members that serve in, in, in parliaments. We also look at strengthening relations between executives and legislatures, but also citizens and the media. We also engage with independent institutions that exist in democracy, such as human rights commissions, audit, commis audit offices, and ombudspersons, uh, where we explore issues of accountability, anti-corruption, um, and how those institutions relate to the legislatures. We also engage with actors such as legislators, uh, political parties, civil society, and the media through skills development and networking with their neighbors and others in the international community. We. The Parliamentary Centre enjoys very strong relations with the House of Commons and the Senate.
And we collaborate with parliamentarians through engaging current and former members of parliament and staff in the work that we do. And Canada has an absolute treasure trove of talent uh, when you look at members of parliament and staff. Interestingly, in Canada, up to 20% of members, uh, depending on the parliament, are born outside of Canada. So it provides a really rich experience uh, uh, for us to draw upon. We engage in thought leadership discussions regarding democracy. We engage with the committees in parliament, such as foreign affairs, status of women and others. We also engage with the friendship groups um, in parliament that exist to promote um, more collaborative ties between Canada and different countries and regions of the world. We also engage with the multilateral associations in parliament uh, through the Commonwealth, La Francophonie, IPU and others. There's also a democracy caucus in parliament, which we engage with and they are a group of MPs that are uh, interested in democracy and how it is working both in Canada and abroad. And also we engage with a, a group of MPs who have a particular interest in democratic development called the parliamentary par parliamentarians for the parliamentary center. We are always looking at supporting a shared goals and those are obviously universal human rights. We, we are in support of a rules-based uh, international order. And we believe that democracies uh, need to be defended um, um, we undertake international networking um, uh, with other organizations that share our goals. Um, we look at issues of democratic norms and standards to see how these can be more widely understood. But also increasingly, we find ourselves as democracies looking at how to counter uh, malign foreign influence in democracies uh, and interference in, in elections, for example. We're looking always for new approaches to regulate democratic processes and elections to make sure that they are fair, transparent and credible. And we're always looking at international trends and keeping an eye on emerging democratic transitions, whether in Belarus, in Thailand, Kazakhstan, and all around the world, so that we can support aspiring Democrats and democracies. Our work is supported by a variety of, of uh, international organizations and, and obviously by Global Affairs Canada. And a little bit about our future. Um, we, we are engaged in a strategic planning process right now where we're reaching out to a number of our partners and uh, interlocutors in Canada and around the world. And we are uh, we will continue to focus on supporting inclusive democratic institutions and actors, particularly looking at the role of women, youth, um, and political parties in, in making democracy work. We also want to increasingly focus on linking development challenges to governance institutions, because we believe that every development challenge has a, a governance challenge at its heart. Um, we also increasingly are looking uh, at the use of technology uh, for engagement. Clearly, the pandemic has, um, has uh, required us to be more remote in our approaches, but we want, to, um, we want to dig deeper on that. We want to learn more about effective engagements with our partners um, using technology because we believe that it will be uh, with us for some time and we can take advantage of the opportunities that technology provides us. We will be a strategic partner of Global Affairs Canada, as well as international development agencies that share our goals of a more democratic and prosperous world. But we also wanna talk about foreign policy and, and the importance of de democratic development to foreign policy uh, more with our uh, policymakers here and with our interlocutors internationally. So we will strengthen partnerships with international and regional democracy support organizations, and we will engage more with other countries uh, to seek partnerships. We want to remain a thought leader on democratic development and to uh, learn more and discuss more about the threats to democracy. And in that regard, we would like to engage more with embassies in Canada, uh, and there are many opportunities for us to do so. We believe democracy is worth safeguarding. Um, and we think that Inclusive decision making not only is the right thing to do, it actually results in smarter decisions. It, it, it research suggests that it uh, that democratic institutions that are inclusive uh, lead to more peaceful and prosperous societies and better development outcomes. And there are a number of ways that we would like to engage you in our work. Uh, I would invite you to visit our website at pearlcent.org to subscribe to our updates, but also to look for opportunities to participate in the discussions we will have on democracy, uh, requesting information from us about some of our work, whether in your country or in a neighboring country, um, and uh, to learn more about our past and current programming. But also uh, there would be opportunities through engaging with us to connect with parliamentarians and Canadian democratic institutions 
to help uh, enrich your understanding of Canada's role, uh, Canada's democratic institutions here, and the work that we do to support democratic institutions abroad. So I do invite you to stay in touch with the Parliamentary Centre through our website, and, and I've left my contact details on the presentation, which will be uh, provided to you. Uh, so follow us on social media, and um, we hope we'll have an opportunity to engage with you in the work that we do in the roads ahead. And so I thank you for your time today, and welcome to Canada. And uh, I wish you a very pleasant and, and uh, productive stay in the country, and hope that our paths cross. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for that uh, introduction to the Parliamentary Center for those who don't know it. Um, and now we're many viewers are going to recognize our next speaker, Stuart Wheeler, who is the Chief of Protocol for Canada. Stuart served previously in the Ontario government after a 20-year career in the Foreign Service with postings in Washington, London, Bogota and Kabul and serving as our ambassador in Iceland. Um, Stuart, it has been a huge challenge for the diplomatic community to adjust to life during the pandemic from Zoom meetings to virtual national days, and it's been an adjustment for global affairs. What is Global Affairs planning this fall for the diplomatic community? Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Maureen, and, uh, and for the chance to be with you today for this really valuable uh, annual event. Uh, like I'm sure all of today's great presenters, I only wish I could see you all in person uh, to help celebrate this 10th anniversary. Comme chef du protocole du Canada, je suis ravi uh, de pouvoir me joindre à vous ce matin et de pouvoir adresser la parole à ce groupe distingué de diplomates et de chefs de mission récemment arrivés à Ottawa. As you say, uh, Maureen, it, it's been a, a huge adjustment for all of us, I think, uh, to adapt diplomacy to the time of COVID. Um, I, I should start off by thanking uh, the diplomatic community for their solidarity, uh, their collaboration, uh, the hard work they've been doing to, to follow public health guidelines, and really uh, working with us uh, as Canadians to, to stem the tide of the spread of the virus. Since March, embassies, uh, high commissions across Ottawa, like, uh, like us at Global Affairs, have moved much of diplomacy online. Uh, over the summer, we were able to take advantage of the warmer weather to move uh, many things outdoors uh, and to at least meet in person in small groups. But now with the cooler weather uh, and the second wave defending, descending upon us, we're, we're really needing to once again adapt our practices to help keep each other safe. At Protocol, we've been reaching out uh, to keep our friends in the diplomatic community up to date with latest protocol procedures and, and adjustments to those procedures because of COVID through uh, regular circular notes, um, which some of, uh, of you in the audience will have seen upon arrival. Uh, we will have a new one coming out uh, in the next week or so, so people should keep an eye out for that. Uh, and of course, if members of the diplomatic community have any questions about protocol procedures, uh, whether it's about accreditation, privileges and immunities, taxes, property, visas, uh, you really shouldn't hesitate to reach out by email to our Office of Diplomatic Corps Services. Normally in October, um, we would now be ramping up with a fall and winter season full of, of outreach activities. Uh, and while uh, we're, we're not in a, in a position yet to do those things in person, we certainly are planning many virtual events. Uh, as a complement uh, to today's rich content, uh, we're organizing our annual Global Affairs Orientation Session for newly arrived diplomats, which is tentatively booked as two separate events this year, one in English uh, on November 23rd and one in French on November 24th. Uh, those events will include remarks from our deputy ministers uh, and participants will have the opportunity to network virtually with officials working in the various geographic divisions and bureaus from across our department who really are you as the diplomatic corps, your, your primary partners and points of entry into our department. We strongly recommend that all new diplomats tune in online for that session uh, and others, of course, are welcome to attend for their interest. Uh, in invitations will be uh, sent out shortly for that. Uh, we recently sent out an invitation um, for an information event uh, for security liaison officers at foreign missions across Canada. And we're, we're hoping to hold that uh, on November 4th in English and November 5th in French. Um, we highly recommend this session for new security officers. Um, but others, of course, are welcome to attend for a refresher if they'd like. Um, if people didn't see the invitation and, and are interested, they should contact the dip diplomatic security email address um, uh, in, at protocol, which all of the foreign missions will have. And finally, uh, one of the most exciting things that, 
that we would normally be doing at this time of year is to partner with one of the offices uh, of protocol of a different province or territory to organize an, uh, an economic outreach mission to visit uh, and get to know a different part of this, this, this great big country. Um, this year, we're working with the government of Alberta uh, and adapting that project for COVID as well. The government of Alberta will be presenting a series of virtual meetings for heads of mission uh, on uh, Alberta's economy, economic recovery plan, uh, and the commitment to investment in global engagement. The first of these presentations is expected to take place in early December, uh, and the invitation will be sent out soon to heads of mission. We look, for we look forward, of course, uh, to being able to arrange an in-person visit to Alberta once health and travel restrictions allow. Through these uh, and other events that we'll be organizing throughout the winter, we really hope to help diplomats and heads of mission, uh, particularly those who've, who've recently arrived uh, and are facing the challenge of networking uh, in the time of COVID, to make the most of their assignments in Ottawa. Thank you again, Maureen, for the excellent uh, webinar this morning and, and for the chance to take part today. Merci et bonjour. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, now we've got lots ahead. We've got uh, a session with the Chief Statistician, the CEO of the Business Council of Canada, and a terrific uh, uh, panel. But we're going to take a short break. Uh, a reminder that documents are available at carlton.ca slash Diplo, and we will be back at 10.50. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, my name is Maureen Boyd. I'm the director of the Carleton Initiative for Parliamentary and Diplomatic Engagement. And we're now starting the second half of our program. And it's my pleasure to introduce the Chief Statistician of Canada, Anil Arora. Since his appointment in 2016, Mr. Arora's focus has been on sharing Statistics Canada data and insights and their importance in making good decisions. Today, he's here to tell you about Statistics Canada resources and its services to the diplomatic community. Mr. Aurora, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Maureen, and uh, your excellencies. It's a real pleasure to be with you uh, today virtually. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, my colleague Casey is gonna go through some slides very rapidly. I believe you're gonna have a copy of it. Um, so uh, don't worry, you'll have all the materials uh, in front of you. So I'll be going through it fairly uh, rapidly. So. Similar to many of our international partners, our role at Statistics Canada is to connect people with data and insights about Canada's society, the economy, and the environment, and we're the country's source for trusted, credible, and independent official statistics. Uh, this role is particularly important during the pandemic as we provide our expertise across the spectrum of federal governments, provincial partners, NGOs, citizens, and, uh, and to you. Uh, we also play a pivotal role on the international stage. Uh, we are the, country, the first country to lead the United Nations Statistical Commission, and our leadership extends uh, across the international community. We work with the OECD, the International Labour Organization, um, IMF, World Bank, etc., and many other international bodies uh, on how to share data and compare data from country to country on a meaningful basis. And our contribution uh, to the during the pandemic has been vital. COVID nineteen has had a major effect on travel, global markets, and international trade. And uh, of course, it magnifies existing socioeconomic differences. Countries with less developed statistical infrastructures uh, will have a more difficult time assessing the impact of the crisis and the impact of the policies for recovery than those that have the necessary health and economic data. I don't, want to I don't plan, as I said earlier, to go through every graph and, and, and table, um, so you can uh, reference these at your leisure. Uh, and I'm going to be providing you really the tip of the tip of the iceberg of data and insights that we offer. So allow me to give you a few highlights about Canada. Um, Canada is small, and it is precisely uh, the reason why we have to punch well above our weight. We are a country of 38 million people with two official languages and a very diverse society. One fifth of Canadians are immigrants. Two thirds of our population growth comes from immigration. Just over one fifth of Canadians are visible minorities, people other than Indigenous people uh, who are non Caucasian in race or non white in color, regardless of birthplace. In Canada, there is a rapidly growing and young Indigenous population of Metis, Inuit, and First Nations people. Uh, they speak over 70 different uh, languages with a rich culture and heritage. We have one of the most educated workforces in the G7. In Canada, the proportion of adults aged 25 to 64 
with tertiary education was 58% in 2018, the absolute highest among uh, OECD countries. In 2018, one quarter, 26% of 25 to 64 year olds in Canada had completed short cycle tertiary education. That is almost four times the OECD average of 7%. In 2017, Canada spent more on primary tertiary educational uh, tertiary education institutions than the OECD average. We put in uh, for US dollars, 14,428 per full-time student uh, compared to uh, 11,231 across the OECD countries. 54% of immigrants in this country come with a bachelor's degree and another 7% have postgraduate degrees. So let, let me move on to health. We have relatively good health uh, and good life expectancy. Prior to COVID, most Canadians reported very good to excellent health, less than 10% reporting unmet health care needs and an average life satisfaction rating in the upper end of the OECD average at 8.1 out of 10. We have strong community safety and justice in Canada. Prior to COVID, nearly nine out of 10 Canadians were satisfied or very satisfied with their personal safety from crime, the highest sense of safety, again, in the OECD countries. Moving on to the, uh, you know, from the social to the economic aspects of Canada, our workforce earns a relatively high after-tax income of $61,000 Canadian. Average weekly earnings are over a thousand Canadian per week. Our GDP was valued at 1.8 trillion in July 2020, with retail sales, exports, imports, and manufacturing as our top contributors to our growth. Uh, moving to uh, again the economy before COVID, COVID-19 of course is an exceptional situation, and like all countries, we're working towards a strong economic recovery as we protect citizens' health and ensure that no one is left behind. Prior to COVID-19, our labor market was strong and unemployment were near record lows. During the lockdown, total employment declined by around 3 million, almost 16% of our workforce, as employment related to tourism and many consumer services, such as retail and accommodation and food, were hardest hit. And the unemployment rate hit a record high of 13.7% in, uh, in May, but by September 2020, uh, it was down to 9%. Our digital economy is growing faster than the rest of the economy and is bigger than some of the country's staple industries, such as mining, forestry, and oil and gas. More than 850,000 of our people work in this sector, a figure that has grown by nearly 40% since 2010. We're leaders in helping measure this sector, working with the OECD and the international community on ways to measure and define various aspects of the digital economy and our society from its reflection in GDP to the definition of labor and the age of gig workers, uh, as well as some of the social impacts of, of digital. Uh, Canada is a vast country, as you all know, with a diverse natural landscape, everything from frozen tundra to mountains to prairie fields to beaches. Our natural resources sector accounts for 10% of our economy and 600,000 jobs. In 2018, environment and clean technology, or ECT, products and services accounted for 3.2% of Canada's GDP and 320,000 jobs. These products and services account for just under 2% of our exports in 2018 and 2.6% of our imports. Average earnings for clean tech uh, jobs were 84,700 in 2018. Once again, I compare that to the economy average of $61,700. Uh, so next slide that just goes you, uh, to show you a little bit of the impacts of robotics and automation. I won't go through uh, more details on that. In light of COVID and like every uh, elsewhere in the, in the world, capital spending has decreased as businesses revise their spending plan. Then this slide shows some of those trends. So in summary for this section, Canada is a diverse country with a highly educated workforce, good quality of life, environmental and technology or growth areas, digitalization is changing the nature of our work. And like all countries, we are seeing the effects of COVID-19 on our economy. Let me move on to trade briefly. Canada is a big nation that has long depended on trade and has a good deal to offer. As part of our work, we measure the impact of tariffs on various industries, including dairy, softwood, lumber, auto parts and automobile industries, not to mention the potential measures of the impacts of tariffs on commodities such as aluminum and steel and potential impacts on jobs and the GDP. Canada, Canada's trade to GDP ratio, the value of exports and imports measured in relation to GDP is over 60%. During the 1990s, much of our export growth reflected higher shipments of manufacturing goods, particularly to the US, 
And in the early 2000s, we shifted to energy exports as a key driver of, can of Canadian trade and contribution to our income growth. We trade on our strengths, and that's, of course, not just hockey players. We trade in energy, including oil and bitumen, although oil and gas production has been on the decline since the COVID-19 lockdowns, a trend that, as you know, had begun uh, even prior to the pandemic. Our imports, half of our uh, imports into Canada come from the U.S., uh, followed by uh, China at 12% and 6.1% from Mexico. Imports arriving from China have slowly uh, grown um, since the uh, 2000s when Chinese goods accounted for 3.2% of imports and were the fifth largest partner country behind the U.S., Japan, U.K., and Mexico. Imports from Germany strengthened over the past decade, increasing from 2.8% of all imports in 2010 to overtake Japan as the fourth largest partner country in 2019 with 3.2%. The U.S. is the main destination for Canadian goods, accounting for 75% of all exports, uh, followed by China at 3.9% and the U.K. at 3.3%. Our exports have slowly become more diversified over the last two decades as the U.S. export share has fallen from as high as 87% in 2000 remaining now at around 70, 75% since, since 2010. Our exports to China have increased significantly um, from, from just under 1% in 2000 to just under 4% in 2019, while the share of Canadian goods going to Mexico and the UK has uh, also increased. Trade is lower in states with proportionally higher number of COVID-19 cases. Our uh, international trade data from March to May underscore the importance of the, the integrated Canada-US supply chains to our overall trade performance. Almost 90% of April's historic decline in exports reflected lower shipments to the US. Similarly, about 90% of the modest rebound in exports in May reflected increased exports to the US. Clearly, an uneven recovery in the US will have major implications for our firms and for our workforce. So to summarize in trade, our main trade partners are the US, China, Mexico, UK, Germany, and Japan, but of course we do trade with uh, so many, so many countries all around the world. Our international trade and investment are crucial to our economic growth. The US economic recovery and the state of the Canada US supply chains have an important impact on our economy. So as of today, there are almost uh, 10,000, unfortunately, deaths due to COVID-19 in Canada. Clearly, COVID has raised significant concerns about the potential disproportionate socioeconomic impacts the world over the relationship between public health and economic recovery, and where governments pace, place emphasis and resources has brought long-term uh, standing issues of equity and fairness, along with social cohesion and wellness uh, to the forefront. And this has created an unprecedented need for timely and detailed data on everything from our personal protective equipment supplies to business closures. So in response, we at Statistics Canada have pivoted our operations. We retooled and we've innovated to create collaborations with other government departments, the business community and NGOs to find ways to get urgently needed data to create real time insights that can be used efficiently. Here you can see preliminary data on the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases to Canadians and researchers. We developed geospatial tools in partnership with other departments to allow them to deliver help where it is needed most. We're using crowdsourcing and web panels to see how people are coping with the crisis and Canadians have participated literally in the hundreds of thousands uh, and our, uh, our, 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 our reach has uh, in, in almost all the numbers show either doubled or tripled. Partnering with the Canadian Chamber of Commerce to conduct the Canadian survey on business conditions, this revealed how many businesses have had to lay off employees or have their rent or mortgage payments deferred, for instance, another iteration of how the survey is now uh, underway. The pandemic has had unprecedented impacts on the quality of life of Canadians with lowered levels of life satisfaction reported since 2003 when we started tracking. Finances, health and social contacts are three pillars of the quality of life. Uh, all of these were affected this year and of course they were affected in every country. During our second quarter, household spending fell by a record 13% as families faced heightened levels of job and income uncertainty. Our employment earnings fell by almost 9% in the second quarter. Strong retail numbers, however, in May and June and housing numbers in July indicate consumers, of course, are opening uh, their pocketbooks. Then the outlook on business investment still remains an area to watch. The outlook on trade, I would say it's mixed, depending largely on developments in the U.S. Employment in several heavily impacted industries, construction, manufacturing, have in fact rebounded to more than 90% of the pre-COVID levels as businesses reopen. 
But of course, by contrast, overall employment in accommodation and food services remain low in an area of concern. Among hourly paid workers, payroll employment in uh, July remained about 13% below February's levels. Workers at the bottom of the earning distribution have a greater risk of job automation and less opportunity for telework, and the economic shutdowns disproportionately impacted many Canadians, including women, youth, new immigrants, visible minorities, and lower age workers. And these are all areas of policy uh, uh, support at this time. Women were hit harder by COVID-19 related employment losses. First Nations, Métis, and Inuit were also uh, uh, more severely affected economically. Our data indicate that the Indigenous people have been harder hit by the economic impacts of the uh, pandemic due to pre-existing vulnerabilities. And evidence in Canada echoes studies in the US and Europe that suggest immigrants are often more severely affected by economic downturns uh, than their native born. Almost all of the data that I've shared with you is available free of charge on our website. This can be useful when looking at conditions your expat communities are facing, uh, when you're trying to bring in other businesses into Canada, uh, and when comparing conditions in Canada to those elsewhere in the world. And of course, COVID-19 has uh, affected some Canadians more than others. Health, the economy, job safety, social inclusion are all interrelated and the need for international comparable well-being indicators to make sustained and inclusive progress will, of course, be key to equitable recovery efforts within Canada, and I'll argue across the board. So I encourage you to visit our website, and if you're looking for facts, trends, insights, and analysis, uh, some easy ways to stay informed are to visit our site and sign up for regular updates through a service called MyStatCan or to follow us on social media. So thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to serving you. Back to you, Maureen. Thank you very much to the chief statistician and for that uh, presentation, which inevitably had to focus on, on the pandemic. Um, and now we're going to pivot to business. This year, we're particularly pleased to have the Business Council of Canada provide this presentation, a big picture but pandemic view of the economy, where Canada is heading, and how the diplomatic community can engage with the business community. The Business Council of Canada is a not-for-profit, nonpartisan organization representing business leaders in every region and sector of the country. Its 150 member companies employ 1.7 million Canadians, contribute the largest share of federal corporate taxes, and more than half of Canada's private sector GDP. Together, they are responsible for most of Canada's exports, corporate philanthropy, and private sector investments in research and development. I'm delighted to welcome its president and CEO, Goldie Hyder. Goldie brings extensive experience in both the private and public sector and is committed to the voluntary sector. He's also served on Carleton University's Board of Governors. Um, I spoke with Goldie last week and asked him where the Canadian economy was going. Oh, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, it is uh, such a critical time to be asking that question, Maureen, because I've asked myself, where are we in this process? You know, is this the beginning, the middle or the end? And, and the best I've been able to come up with is we might be at the end of the beginning, but there's still a ways to go here. So the answer is it depends on how long uh, we're going to need to deal with this. We have seen a reaction on the part of the Canadian government. Um, you know, they stepped in immediately to put a floor on the collapse uh, of the lives of individuals. We in the business community called for an economic, you know, shutdown, literally, to try and contain the virus, but more importantly, protect our healthcare system and to protect our the validity of our healthcare system and the viability of it, which I think we were able to do and do well. And then we came through the summer and now we're here in the winter and we're looking forward and saying, is, is how hard is this period going to be, both psychologically, physically, emotionally? And what toll is it going to take on our economy? Because the truth is, our economy is, is not really restarted. It's open, but it's not restarted. And we're seeing a lot of the sort of the whack-a-mole popping up and popping down of, the, of, the, of, the, of temporary lockdowns here and there. And so I think that, um, uh, you know, the bad news, of course, is very obvious. The headline is we spent a lot of money. You know, we have spent, uh, we have created uh, probably $400 billion, uh, you know, worth of deficit alone, another 1.3 on the, on, the, on the debt, GDP dropped dramatically, uh, unemployment is up uh, uh, quite a bit. 
Uh, we're not alone, but that doesn't make it any better for the people who are feeling the consequences of this, uh, of this economic collapse. There are a number of sectors that have been very hardly hit. And as you know, the Canadian economy is really about two things, natural resources and human resources. And so when you look at the natural resources side, obviously the energy sector was having its challenges even before uh, COVID arrived at our doorstep, but now they're gonna need to deal with the consequences of, of the additional burden that COVID has also put on, put on their situation. And then you, we've heard so much about travel, tourism, you know, retail. Uh, these are these are in hospitality. These are sectors that are, in some cases, on life support, Maureen, and they 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 employ hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Canadians. And so our message to the government has been: is while you've done a good job in putting a floor on the collapse of the individual, we, those individuals need jobs. They need employers to go back to, and we need to make sure that we make strategic investments and choices about some of these critical sectors that really define who a country is. Imagine a country without an airline or a country that doesn't have uh, any uh, tourism industry or so forth. It's a big part uh, of who we are. So those are very critical questions. And then the other thing that we're seeing, a couple of things that are very important to us, you know, um, uh, you know it's been dubbed a she session, that this is having a very big impact on, on women in, uh, in, their, in, in the economy and in the workplace. And, you know, we come out calling support for childcare, for example, uh, not that just just a woman issue, it's a man and woman issue, but uh, it predominantly seems to impact uh, uh, the moms at home. And we want to make sure that from a workforce perspective, we've got the opportunity to make sure that people are able to participate uh, in the recovery of the economy. And that's, there's some good news underway here as well, right? I mean, we have basically got back, you know, uh, several million of the jobs that we've lost. Uh, there's about 700 or so, 720,000 or so positions that remain uh, to be filled. So we're, we're heading in the right, uh, right direction but it doesn't mean we're out of the woods just yet, right? 2021, early 2021, when these programs that the government has put in place maybe get pulled back, it may create a rise in un uh, unemployment. So we've got we've to be ready and we've got we've to watch for that. And, and the good news for Canadians and, and you know, the esteemed guests I'm speaking with today know this, we're a trading nation and we have a lot of stuff that people want, you know, and as long as we're able to get it to them and be reliable in our infrastructure and, and, and our policies and so forth, the demands for our products are gonna be there. But we're also a human resource economy, as I mentioned. And if you think about the importance of the climate, an issue important to all of us, um, where the solutions are gonna require collaboration and, and innovation, Canada has an important role uh, to play there. The digital economy, the digitization that's taken place. I mean, where are we today if we were dialing up for this phone call, uh, you know, this video call it just wouldn't have worked uh, as well as this has. So uh, we've seen a really robust response on the part of Canadian businesses, large and small, and we worry a lot about our supply chains and the SMEs. Um, but the response has been wartime-like, right? People have adjusted. Uh, we've kept people employed. We've been donating to charitable causes. We innovated to respond to the PPE crisis that we faced. And so I think this has been a, a good moment in, in government business relationships uh, as we go forward. So um, you, you, what's your premier ask of government and has government been responsive? Um, look, Canada is a really difficult country to govern. And uh, I, I know that uh, some of our, our, our ambassadors and others here experienced that firsthand and it might frustrate them, but we're not alone. There's a lot of federations that have challenges uh, in, in working with the multi-jurisdictional layers. I think that's one of the issues that Canadians are experiencing, Maureen, is um, a sense of, of, of a need for clear directive, clear leadership. Uh, you know, we're taping this just on the eve of Halloween here. Some say it's okay. Some say it's not okay. They're both public health experts. Who do I follow? So I think we needed, we need to continue to do a better job in speaking to Canadians as clearly and consistently and with one voice. And I think that applies to all of your respective countries because human nature requires that uh, uh, in, in a crisis. And so I think that's important. I think uh, business and government, as I mentioned, have been very good at partnering on the issue of the PPEs. Uh, you know, you take a look at many of our members, you know, CAE, um, you know, Magna, Linamar, uh, you know, uh, Canada Goose, you know, and they, they converted to making attire 
for our hospital, uh, uh, you know, workers and nurses and doctors and stuff, and people were making ventilators, some of the companies that I just mentioned. So that's been a, a really important um, uh, opportunity to work with government, where I think we can do better and where I think we can learn from some of the, the folks that are here listening today. And I have the, you know, the extreme privilege of, of, uh, of visiting and or hosting uh, many of the people I suspect that are that are on this uh, uh, call in this event today, we learn from each other. How is it that other countries of different political stripes, of different geographies, of different sizes and scales, what have they done well and what have they not done well? And let's make sure that, because to me, COVID is actually a reminder of the importance of multilateralism, something I'm sure we're going to talk about as well. It's a way to show people that this is, this is how well it can work when we can actually uh, figure out how to help each other through this crisis. Because there's no point me solving COVID for myself. It's no good if it's not gonna help everybody else. You know. Well, I was and gonna I to touch on that system. because you, you speak regularly with Canada's business leaders and many of whom represent uh, companies with offices around the world. They're in a slightly different situation than Canadian businesses that are with just within our country. What's keeping those companies that have got offices around the world up at night well, it's a great question. Um, you, you know, before I, the COVID, I would have said it was largely about, you know, cybersecurity or talent, you know, the things that would have kept most of our CEOs uh, awake at night. But now, of course, we have to deal with this pandemic. And so the, the, the health emergency and the need to be able to provide safe working places at home or otherwise for our employees, the experience for our customers is paramount to any CEO. Safety is always item number one. And so th this has just exacerbated that that much more. And I think there's a lot of curiosity to want to learn from each other amongst Canadian businesses, but also global businesses. Who's doing what? How well are they managing? You know, uh, there is an acceleration taking place for many businesses. Now, that's the word I hear the most. Things that might have been happening in Canada three, four, five years down the road have been brought forward and they're happening now. And so that requires change and change management and CEOs are very busy doing that on the health front. But of course, you know, businesses compete and the pandemic doesn't you know, say, well, let's lay down all our arms here, but people are still very competitive and CEOs have a fiduciary duty and a responsibility to make sure that they are doing everything that they can to make sure that their business is viable, uh, is growing. Um, you know, many businesses are essential services that, that have been able to, to meet the needs of Canadians and global uh, global partners throughout this uh, pandemic. Um, but but we've, 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 we've also had to um, recognize that things are changing. You know, what we don't know is, are they changing for the short term, midterm, or forever? And I think that's, uh, you know, subject for an entire other discussion, happened to be the subject of my master's thesis 30 years ago. And I think we have to be very careful as to how much we think change is really happening when we're talking about human beings. Given the pandemic, what recommendations you, do you have for diplomats for engaging with Canadian business? Yeah, that's a, again, a, a great question. I mean, you know, your audience knows, you know, firsthand that Canada is a trading nation. Uh, there are three legs to the Canadian stool that cannot uh, be, be, be removed or the whole thing stumbles. Trade being one of them, immigration being another, and investment uh, being the other. And those three things are really central to our Canadian economy. And it's for that reason, uh, many of the CEOs I speak with who not only care about the domestic issues, as you noted, many of them are globals, we're quite concerned about the protectionists, uh, the rise in protectionism, uh, if you will. Uh, as you know, our, our federal government um, from its uh, time uh, back in 2015, and frankly, its predecessor who uh, created a lot of trade deals from what was and, and what, they, what they left with, really made diversification a critical strategy for Canada. And I think that this is the opportunity for, uh, you know, uh, representatives of other countries to, to talk about why you, why should in a world full of, of, of countries and options for businesses and for countries in which to do trade, why you? What is your USP? What is your value proposition as a, as a respective country? And I think businesses are, are frankly shopping around. Uh, you know, there is anxiety about the decoupling. Uh, there is anxiety about the U.S.-Canada situation. I'm uh, sorry, the U.S., uh, that was a previous life, but still <laughs> may come back, who knows. Uh, but the U.S.-China situation uh, and, and Canada, frankly, being stuck in, in the middle of all. These are all things that are causing uh, members anxiety. But what we're saying is we can lead. 
Canada can lead and countries that are not superpowers can lead. And so I applaud the leadership of our government on the WTO reform process. Uh, you know, businesses need rules. We need rule of law. We need rule of order. We need predictability, stability uh, as to where our investments are, are going to be going. And so I think that the more you're able to connect the priorities of the business community uh, to your, your agenda for investment and growth in your respective countries, governments will pay attention because the truth of the matter is, as uh, you know, my old friend Jim Carr says when, when he was the minister, you know, government's role was to build the bridge. Uh, that's been done. The trade agreements have been put in place. We frankly don't need more trade agreements. What we need to do is realize the benefits of the ones that we have. And so I think you're going to see Canadian businesses focusing on the, the CPTPP uh, uh, as, as, as well as CETA and potentially, uh, you know, the United Kingdom and a few others that the conversations are continuing with. And let's not kid ourselves. The United States is and will always be a very, very important uh, trading partner for Canada. But irrespective of what happens in this election, we're not convinced that it's necessarily going to change for the, for the better uh, from a business investment and a business perspective, time will tell. And last question, we're in a minority parliament. Uh, there's gonna be more and more talk of uh, snap elections being called. We avoided one last week. Um, what, uh, how, how does that uh, change the environment for you? Well, I mean, there's an old saying I grew up with, uh, you know, don't take the politics out of politics. But if ever there was a time to take the politics out of something, it's during a pandemic. And I think um, any political party should be forewarned that the mood of Canadians is uh, volatile uh, at this time. I think there is high degree of anxiety. Uh, I think that they are looking for their leaders to provide leadership. I think they're looking for clear direction, clear plan, clear guidance. Frankly, I think many Canadians are saying, tell me what you want me to do specifically, exactly. And so don't, don't recommend, don't suggest. I think this is a moment for leadership. And I think this is a moment where uh, ask those who are aspiring to run provinces or countries or cities can really stick out because people will gravitate to those that are providing clear, honest, Relation, uh, you know, uh, uh, communications with their citizenry, because uh, I think many recognize that there's a long road to go here. You know, I don't want to be a, the downer of the event, but the, the reality is know your history. It takes time to create vaccines. It takes time to produce the logistics with which to execute uh, the vaccine successfully. There are going to be a number of people who are not even going to take the vaccine. Kids won't be able to take it for years due to the efficacy issues around vaccinating kids. So we need to prepare our people that there's a long road ahead, but we need to give them hope. We need to give them hope that we can get through this. Don't live in fear. We're gonna to have to coexist with COVID. And I think that um, uh, the Canadian people are, are ready to be, to be led in that direction. And we're gonna need it because as I said, there's, there's still a long road uh, to go here. Thanks to Goldie Hyder for that astute analysis. And we're now coming to one of the most highly regarded sessions of previous orientations. Uh, we have reassembled our panel of journalists and commentators. Colin Robertson will moderate this panel, a former diplomat. Colin served in New York, Hong Kong, as Consul General in Los Angeles, and is the founding head of the Advocacy Secretariat in Washington. He's a Carleton graduate and senior fellow of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. He's vice president of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute and a frequent media commentator. You'll note from the program that Colin has written a brief. It's called Personal Reflections, what foreign diplomats need to know about Canada. It's on our website and the CGA website. Colin is joined by Susan Delacourt. Uh, Susan has covered politics on Parliament Hill for more than 30 years. She's a political columnist for the Toronto Star, an author of four books, and a frequent media commentator. She has taught both journalism and political communication at Carleton University. We're also going to be joined by Joel Denis Bellavance. He's not on yet, I don't believe, but he'll be coming. He is a Carleton Journalism School graduate. He's been covering parliament and national affairs for the past 25 years. Since 2003, he has been bureau chief for La Presse, Quebec's leading newspaper. Colin, your panel, which right now is just Susan. Okay, thanks very much, Maureen, and uh, welcome, Susan. Well, Susan, let me start with a question about the impact that the U.S. election is having. A lot of the speakers this morning, you know, we do this 
uh, against the backdrop of the election, which is going to take place a week from now. How has it affected Canadian politics? Oh, a huge and very good question. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for having me and um, welcome to Canada, all of you out there. I wish I was there in person to meet you all, but I'm sure someday things will be normal and we will meet again. Um, so your question, as I said, is a very good one and a very large one. Uh, there is an argument to be made that Justin Trudeau's first mandate uh, was thrown completely off by the election of Donald Trump. Uh, many of the things that, that, that Justin Trudeau believed he'd be doing in tandem with a Democratic president of the United States were thrown into chaos in January of 2017 after Donald Trump was inaugurated. So, um, and, and many of the mistakes you could say of this government's first term, when things got a little shaky, could be could be attributed to how all-consuming and chaotic that relationship was. So I think Justin Trudeau, a few, I guess it's now about a couple of months ago, ordered his cabinet ministers and caucus not to wade into this election in any way. Not even nice tweets about Kamala Harris. Some of the cabinet ministers had to take those down when she was nominated. Um, so the, the uh, the idea is that stay quiet. Um, I think it would be assumed that Joe Biden would be a more natural ally to a Justin Trudeau, maybe put this country back on a more progressive partnership course with the United States. But as Goldie was just saying, um, not all problems are going to be solved by Trump being gone. And the Canada-US relationship is is still going to be huge. And the Canada-China problem will still exist, too. Well, this government, Susan, has got a very ambitious agenda. And in the, uh, the throne speech, the government, I think, as all governments have done, put their first priority as COVID, dealing with COVID, and then recovery from COVID. But there's also big elements of climate change that we talked about earlier. Catherine McKenna made this point, having been former Ministry of the Environment, and then uh, an infrastructure plan. And then, of course, there's dealing with social justice, inequality, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, uh, this government that is, as you pointed out, a progressive government. How, in the time that remains in this parliament, is the government going to be able to deal with these other items, or is the focus going to be simply on COVID and COVID recovery? Yeah, I would add one thing to that, too. Um, I think there's going to be two focuses, or do you say foci, in the, uh, in the coming days. One is, I think, I'll just back up a bit. I think two months ago, you saw that the government thought that COVID uh, was going to be a chance to build back better, which is, you know, we hear this joke from Joe Biden as well. I think... The second wave of COVID, the magnitude of it, the numbers you're seeing every day, the idea that it's not going away, has overtaken that discussion a little bit for now. You're seeing that we're not going to have a budget until next year. We're, um, the second wave of COVID has definitely um, pushed a lot of the government's ambitions, I think, farther down the road. Um, what is more immediate, and we're seeing it every day, and if you want a subtitle under every political news item you're watching at the moment, it is this government is still fighting for survival. I am not sure. I wrote a column last week saying I am now trying to figure out which is going to last longer, the second wave of COVID or this government, because I think we're going to see week by week day by day, uh, a struggle in this minority parliament to see whether it can survive uh, into 2021, because there is clearly hostility there is between the, the two. Uh, we saw in by-elections last night that should have been safe liberal ridings. Justin Trudeau was given a run for his money by the Greens in one riding, Conservatives in another. And I think that Certainly conservatives and, uh, are feeling emboldened and um, 
I, I think feeling that maybe the the few months of collaboration didn't work out all that well. So I think we've got a very angry, antagonistic parliament right now. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to last. We've got a second wave of COVID, and I do think those are those are the top two priorities before they get down to how do they do the progressive agenda they wanted so much. Oh, that makes sense. Sholdeni, have you been able to join us yet? Okay. Um, I'm sure he'll join us there in a is. moment. He's on now. He's on now. Sholdeni? Yes. Can uh, you hear me now? Um, Perfect. Yes, I was just going to, we were, Susan and I were just talking about the government's priorities, the focus obviously being COVID and COVID recovery, but there is a progressive agenda. And Susan was saying, well, the focus has got to be for now on COVID and these other elements, it, while they are important, it may be a while before they get to them. What's your assessment? Well, exactly the same assessment. Uh, the government was uh, uh, hoping to be able to achieve a new norm. Uh, uh, build better. That was their slogan when they were uh, trying to um, um, figure out what to put in the speech from the throne that was tabled on September 23rd. But they realized that trying to build better in a pandemic was not possible, that they had to ride, first of all, that wave of COVID-19 pandemic and uh, come back at the alerted date. So there's a lot of uncertainty uh, around the, 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 the how much time this uh, pandemic will last. And so the government was forced to go back to its uh, the, to the drawing board and rewrite almost all the uh, speech from the throne and 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 bring it back to reality, which was which is still you know the pandemic, the COVID nineteen pandemic. So, but there are still ministers who would like to see a big push, trying to make sure that Canada can meet, for example, its uh, twenty thirty uh, Paris uh, um, um, G G G. Uh, G um, um, the uh, gas emission, the the sire <laughs> uh, reduction, carbon emission. Yes, 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 carbon emission. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and and so they're trying to push that, and the, that was also written in the uh, speech from the throne. Uh, the government wanted to show that it was able to walk and chew gum at the same time. But for now, I think it's more walking than chewing gum because of the reality <laughs> of the pandemic, which is uh, you know a crisis, uh, a health crisis, an economic crisis, which may take a long time to get over uh, maybe or some people are saying maybe three to four years to get over this crisis so uh, it will have to wait I think but it's still part of the priorities of the government but it has to be uh, relegated at the bottom of the priorities for now. Sheldon, one of the things that Susan said that you know this government is a minority government and that's certainly been stressed from the outset the clerk and the speaker talking about managing this uh, Susan said we're not you know this this government could fall depending on for things What's your sense? Remember, all the foreign diplomats have to write back to their capitals. What's their sense of the longevity of this government? What's your sense? Um, my sense is that this government will probably face a defeat next spring after it tables a budget, but also after the ethics commissioner tables a report on the prime minister uh, ethical um, issues with the We Charity uh, controversy that was, uh, you know, uh, rocking the boat this summer for the government. And uh, so my sense is the opposition parties will now join forces after at that time in the spring of 2021 to try to defeat the government. If not, I'm convinced, and by talking to liberal strategists, if the government is not defeated in the spring, Mr. Trudeau himself will go see the governor general in September of next year to call an election asking for a clear mandate to uh, to manage this crisis. So it's either in the spring of next year or in the fall of next, uh, next, next year. If not, if those scenarios do not happen, my expectation is that uh, the government may last four years. This minority government may last a total of mandate, a regular mandate, as though it was a majority government, four years, which would bring us to 2023. Why? Because in 2022, there are two big uh, elections in two of Canada's biggest provinces. In the spring of 2022, Ontario voters will go to the polls. So that takes out the calendar for any uh, federal election. And in the fall of 2022, Quebecers will go to the polls, which again takes out that uh, electoral calendar for the federal uh, uh, federal for a federal election. So that means that leads to me that if it's not next year, it will probably be in 2023 for the following reasons that I just mentioned. Sheldon, I'm going to stay with you for a minute on this next question. 
because as you pointed out, we are a, a, a country of different provinces and different regions. And a year ago, when we had this conversation, you had spent your summer touring Western Canada. At that time, there was a lot of concern that we were seeing once again uh, forces of division, forces, some advocating for separation. We've traditionally tended to look to Quebec, which you know very well, but you've gone to the West because of the, the Wexit movement. Is, is that still an issue or has COVID kind of covered that? The, you know, the prime minister and the premiers talk every Thursday night. And my view is that that seems to have built at least a certain degree of camaraderie and, and shared uh, goals to try and deal with this crisis on, as was pointed out by Goldie. I mean, there has been a coming together, but I'm wondering your perspective on an issue that, again, foreign diplomats have to cover, and that's the unity of this country. Um, my sense is that it's, it may not be boiling to the surface as it was last year, but it's close to. Uh, yes, COVID-19 has brought you know, the premiers and the prime minister together to face this un invisible um, enemy, which is COVID-19. But uh, deep down, if you go to Alberta and even Saskatchewan, uh, the COVID-19 has brought uh, a double whammy crisis for, for Albertans and Saskatchewans. When I visited Calgary uh, last year, for example, 25% of uh, commercial offices were empty in downtown Calgary. I'm assuming that this has now doubled because of the crisis related to COVID-19. And so I would say that the people are getting desperate economically and they don't see any uh, potential um, uh, uh, improvement in their life, day-to-day -day life situation in the future. And which brings me to the future, which is the uh, U.S. elections, and that may amplify the separatist movement in, in Western Canada if one of the pipelines that have been approved by President uh, Donald Trump, the Keystone XL uh, uh, pipeline, is cancelled as promised by Joe Biden if he wins the election. So uh, Mr. Kenny, uh, the, the Jason Kenny, the Premier of Alberta, has already uh, let it known that he is not happy with that possibility. So in Alberta, for, in, in a very ironic way, when I was there, there were a lot of people who were actually um, hoping to see Donald Trump win the next election. And it's probably one of the rare provinces where you see more support for Donald Trump uh, uh, than anywhere else in Canada, surprisingly, uh, because they feel that if they can't make a deal with the rest of Canada and getting a new pipeline in the ground, they may have to uh, turn to separation. And even some of were uh, talking about annexing Alberta with uh, the United States. So. Um, and one thing that is characterizing the debate, I think, and it's clear that we need to take that into account, is that it's no longer a rational debate for some people. It's an emotional debate. And when emotions take over, rational decisions are not being made. It's, it, it's decision made on emotions. And you can't let emotions guide you when you take a decision as serious as the future of Canada. Susan, I couldn't help reflect that uh, Premier Mo, who's just won re-election in his uh, victory speech, basically took a shot at the federal government on what they weren't doing for Saskatchewan, even though he comes back with uh, appears to be an enhanced majority. What's your sense on the unity issue? We've talked a lot about the West. Uh, prime ministers have sort of always said that, I've talked to them, they have three big issues. We've talked about the economy, uh, national security, Canada-US relations, but national unity is always uh, on the in, in the inbox for any prime minister. Where are you? What are you seeing? It's funny because in the in what we now call the olden days, the pre-pandemic days, we thought the major issue in 2020 was going to be the unity of this country. There was a very fractious uh, federal provincial scene. Many, many conservative premiers as uh, and and a liberal government. We actually thought that was going to be Justin Trudeau's biggest headache. Little did we know. Um, a couple of interesting things have happened though on national unity. JD was referencing. Um, I, I think you are seeing Alberta and Saskatchewan starting to dig in again, despite, as you talked about, Colin, the camaraderie that's developed. But one interesting thing that has developed, and I speak for my home province of Ontario, um, is the relationship between the Premier Doug Ford and this Liberal government. It is remarkable. No one ever would have predicted it a year ago. A year ago, Justin Trudeau was taking shots at Doug Ford every day on the campaign trail. Now they're doing events together. The Deputy Prime Minister, Krista Freeland, uh, has forged much of this relationship, um, talks on the phone all the time to Doug Ford. Doug Ford has said he will not campaign 
with Aaron O'Toole, the conservative leader, in the next election. Um, and on, Doug Ford is up to something interesting here. He is not being part of what uh, was famously termed the provincial resistance, um, conser all those conservative premiers. He's doing his own thing with the federal government. And that is, um, that is a highly interesting development here in Canada and one I'm watching really carefully. Doug Ford has, uh, of, of all the people in this pandemic who's emerged as interesting, uh, Doug Ford may be the, the biggest one. If I may say, Colin, you, just, just ahead, to add Jordan. one point that I want to make about Jason Kenney, the Premier of Alberta. If he's trying to cool the temperature about, you know, separatist sentiment in his own province by holding a referendum maybe next year on the equalization program, uh, federal equalization programs, but he also wants to follow the steps of Quebec, which uh, would lead him to open, I think, and that will uh, interest our audience, opens more uh, delegations, uh, foreign delegations for the provinces uh, of Alberta. Um, delegations in the United States, yes, but also uh, more delegations, de new delegations in, in Europe and Asia. Why? Because the province would like to pursue its own interests, like Quebec has done uh, internationally. So you see m some provinces uh, uh, following the steps of, of Quebec, which has some delegations in, in the United States and in Europe and Asia. So uh, Jason Kenney is taking the same recipe as Quebec to get more leeway uh, powers with, uh, the, from the federal government. So that's something to watch, uh, opening up of uh, foreign delegations by the province of Alberta. And Joel Denis, you underlined a point that I would uh, say to all the ambassadors and to their representatives, and that is to get out to the provinces. You, you can't, just as you can't decide what's happening in the United States within the Beltway, in Canada, you really do have to get out and visit the premiers because they really do have uh, constitutionally a lot of power. The way we divided up our constitution in 1867 and since then court rulings and things have given our provinces and premiers a lot of authority, particularly in the area of natural resources and trade, of course, a shared responsibility. Well, I think I may have a, sort of a last question, which I'm going to put, and I'll start with you, Susan, and that is making foreign policy. We have a foreign minister, but things are a little bit clouded. We also have a deputy prime minister who's responsible for the U.S. In terms of foreign policy making, a couple of ambassadors have said to me, so who really, who makes foreign policy in Canada? We, we know the organization chart, but you as a journalist, what's your observation? And then I'm going to ask Joel Denis to come in on this as to who are the players who actually make our foreign policy? I would suspect JD and I are going to say the same thing here. Do <laughs> not discount um, Krista Freeland, the deputy prime minister, is now the minister of everything. Uh, she works inside the prime minister's office. Um, her office is there. She, uh, she's the finance minister too. Um, Krista Freeland has uh, extensive experience. She's a former journalist who is a former foreign uh, correspondent who has uh, worked in journalism, knows what she's talking about, and the people around her, that is a very tight circle. Um, one, uh, there's, a, there's been some speculation that Justin Trudeau is sort of mailing it in, um, which I want to dispel right now. Justin Trudeau, what he has been doing has been consolidating power around him uh, and making a very tight circle. And no one is tighter with him than Krista Freeland. And if you want to know how this government works, you've got to know Krista Freeland and on anything. And, and one thing you've underlined there, that is that uh, Mr. Trudeau really is interested in being prime minister and will lead the party into the next election. Definitely. Joel Denis? I totally agree with Susan. Krista Freeland is the go-to person. She has a lot of influence. And she has also a lot of influence because of, of her roots and her experience as a reporter. She traveled the world, not as a tourist, but uh, by working in capitals as Moscow, New York, and Washington, and out in London. So she knows the big, the big, the, the big, um, the big um, issues of the day. And so if you want to have a clear picture of where the government stands on some big issues dealing with international relations, Krista Freeland is the one that will explain it to you very, very calmly and in a very uh, substantive matter. In fact, uh, if there was, there's one reading I would recommend to uh, ambassadors would be to read her speech she made a couple of years ago in the House of Commons 
as for when she was yeah. foreign affairs minister. This was a very substantive speech, and she described her vision of the world as seeing that the United States was re- withdrawing from international organization, multilateralism, and she was presenting Canada's case very uh, in a very effective manner. And so this is, would be a good read to grasp where this government it might be going in terms of uh, foreign affairs relations. A very good speech, and I uh, read it uh, again recently, and it was a very, very uh, thoughtful and very well balanced and very well presented. And it explained where Canada was coming from, but also where Canada wants to go. Now, I would underline your recommendation, and in the primer, it's one of the ones that there's a hyperlink to. Uh, well, look, my last question, and I'll start with you, Susan. Uh, and Joel Denise kind of set this up by what he's been reading. If you had to read a book about Canada to recommend to somebody who's just arrived in Canada, a foreign diplomat, what would you recommend? A novel, even your own books on, on Canadian <laughs> politics. But what would you oh, yeah. recommend, Susan? Please, uh, please read all my books. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, understand I, the I, Canadian uh, political system. <laughs> I, I do. Um, I, I would recommend that people read um, uh, Justin Trudeau's own biography, at least the first few chapters, if you want to understand the man. Uh, I think that's an important thing to do. Oh, uh, so many books I could uh, I could give. That's, tons that's of them, all right. You've given us one, Joel like, Denis. What would you recommend? Well, I wouldn't necessarily necessarily uh, recommend books. I would recommend reading uh, Susan Delacourt's column, and I think that they provide a good picture <laughs> of where we are going. And also Chantal Hébert, uh, one of my favorite columnists, also with Susan at the Toronto Star. So you get a great view of Ontario. And uh, I will also recommend another columnist, uh, Don uh, Don Martin, uh, who has a weekly column that still uh, is being published on the website of CTV Newsnet. And in terms of uh, Quebec. Great columnists, uh, I would say, uh, are, are, are uh, Michel David from Le Devoir. He knows the Quebec uh, files inside out. And also uh, in my own backyard, I would say Paul Journet. He's a new columnist at La Presse, and he presents you know, the situation. But uh, those would be the readings I would recommend before reading any books on Canada. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, so I, I, the virtual audience will join me in uh, thanking Susan Delacour of the Toronto Star, whose columns as Joel Denis says, are indispensable reading, and Joel Denis Bellevance of La Presse, whose own work is uh, certainly should be read. Uh, thank you for joining me today in this discussion about Canadian politics. Thank you, Colin, and my apologies for being late. Welcome again to Canada. <laughs> Thank you, Colin Robertson. Thank you. My thank you also to Susan Delacorte and Joël Denis Bellavance for your time, your advice and insights on the players, the provinces, the policy, um, and some recommendations for reading. So I appreciate that. So we've talked about our parliamentary system with the speaker, clerk, members of parliament. We've heard about public opinion trends. We've heard from our panel. Our next session is engaging with the National Capital Region. And our next speaker is Toby Nussbaum, the CEO of the National Capital Commission. Toby was a diplomat and senior public servant before he ran for Ottawa City Council in 2014. He was reelected in 2018 and then resigned to lead the NCC. Toby's presentation starts with a short history and tour of the National Capital Region and ends with how you can engage with the NCC. Good morning, bonjour, Quay, and thank you for inviting me to participate today at your session at the end of a long morning. And congratulations to the Carleton Initiative for Parliamentary and Diplomatic Engagement for keeping this worthy tradition alive for 10 years, uh, even though this year, of course, we have more extraordinary circumstances. And for those of you who are newly posted here on behalf of the National Capital Commission, welcome to the National Capital Region. Au nom de la Commission de la Capitale Nationale, uh, je souhaite la bienvenue dans la région de la Capitale du Canada à ceux d'entre vous qui sont uh, nouvellement affectés ici. We hope your time here is productive and rewarding. And having served uh, Canada abroad myself, I know from personal experience that the diplomatic life can be busy professionally, but I hope you'll also find time to enjoy life in Canada and in our capital. 
And I invite all of you, newcomers and uh, veterans, uh, to find ways to participate in the life of the capital. Ottawa was chosen as Canada's capital city more than 150 years ago, when it was a rough and tumble lumber town with a population of just a few thousand on the edge of the Canadian wilderness. Today, Canada's capital includes not just Ottawa, but also the city of Gatineau on the Quebec side of the Ottawa River, along with several smaller municipalities, and it's home to over a million people. Uh, but it is actually still on the edge of the Canadian wilderness, uh, which is one of its enduring charms and defining characteristics. Protecting and preserving the natural legacy of the capital region, along with the elegant beauty of its built heritage, is really the raison d'etre of the organization I represent. Because the National Capital Commission is the chief planner and steward of the federal government's land and assets in the capital, uh, if you're out enjoying what the capital has to offer, there's a good chance the NCC is involved. For example, we're responsible for Gatineau Park, where the capital's wild character is really on display. The park's extensive trails wind through some ruggedly beautiful landscapes and emerge onto breathtaking lookouts. It's a terrific place to hike or ski, uh, and if you enjoy outdoor winter activities, um, you, you can also not just ski, but snowshoe or try winter cycling. There's really a range of things to do in Gatineau Park uh, in all seasons. Another quintessential Canadian and Canada's capital experience is skating on the Rideau Canal Skateway, the world's longest skating rink. And another great place to experience the Canadian outdoors in any season without even leaving the city is on the trails of the Green Belt. It's a ring of forests and wetlands and farms that encircles Ottawa's urban core. And woven, of course, throughout the entire capital on both sides of the river is one of the most extensive multi-use pathway networks in North America, much of it the NCC's responsibility. These outdoor assets and some of the amenities associated with them are open for use despite the coronavirus. Uh, subject, of course, to public health guidelines, such as physical distancing. And so I really encourage you uh, to go and check them out, uh, again, through all four seasons. However, the NCC is also responsible for many other elements in the capital that improve the quality of life of its residents, create great memories for the millions who visit every year, and support its role as the heart of Canadian democracy. More than 100 kilometers of scenic parkways along the Ottawa River and the Rideau Canal and throughout Gatineau Park, as I've mentioned. More than 100 bridges, including two of the interprovincial bridges linking Ottawa and Gatineau. More than 1,000 buildings, including the official residences of the Governor General, the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, and the Speaker of the House of Commons, who you heard from earlier this morning. And federal monuments and commemorations uh, throughout the capital. But besides being the principal planner and steward of the capital, the NCC has a third role, that of creative partner. Collaboration is in our organizational DNA, and we engage frequently with individuals and organizations who share our passion for building a better capital. An important part of this engagement has been rewarding partnerships with the diplomatic community. For example, in 2017, the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands worked with us to promote the Canada 150 tulips marking the 150th anniversary of Confederation. And last year to promote the Liberation 75 tulips marking the anniversary of the Dutch royal family taking shelter in the capital and the liberation of the Netherlands by Canadian soldiers. We've worked with the U.S. Embassy uh, on restoring Mackenzie Avenue, uh, where their embassy is located, including the installation of a new uh, cycling lane. L'Ambassade de France nous a aidé à célébrer le 400e anniversaire de l'arrivée de Samuel de Champlain. Embassies, including those of France, Norway, the Netherlands, and the United States, have partnered with us to present session in the NCC's Urbanism Lab, where I am sitting right now, where normally members of the public meet on a monthly basis with experts to discuss the latest thinking uh, in urban affairs. 
and the Embassy of Norway, I should mention, which shares Canada's passion for cross-country skiing uh, and has hosted events related to that sport in past years uh, with the NCC as a participant. And lastly, a number of embassies participated in the NCC's International Pavilion, another Canada 150 initiative. And if you partnered with us over the past, I thank you. And for those who haven't, I certainly invite all of you to get involved in future projects and initiatives. Je tiens à remercier ceux qui se sont associés à nous par le passé. Et je vous invite tous à vous impliquer dans les initiatives et les projets uh, futurs. There will be many opportunities for engagement, especially once we put the coronavirus behind us. And I look forward to meeting those of you who are new to the capital and uh, to many successful partnerships in the years to come. So again, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me this morning. And I look forward to meeting many of you in person soon. Thank you. Merci, Magritte. And thank you, Toby Nussbaum, for this look at where we live. We're coming to the end. We hope this webinar has been useful. It's been a new experience for us as well as for you. I'd like to take a moment to thank Esther, Maria Esther Coronado Martinez for her work on this webinar and to our excellent technical team at Carleton. I also wish to thank our 10 generous sponsors, Air Canada, CN, Facebook, Forest Products Association of Canada, Insurance Bureau of Canada, GlaxoSmithKline, Nutrien, Suncor, TD, and Toyota. We will leave you with closing remarks from Carleton University's brand new Dean of Public Affairs. Dr. Brenda O'Neill started October 1st as Dean and as a professor of political science. I'm sure that many of you will get to know her during your posting. Dean O'Neill. Thanks very much, Maureen. Uh, first, I'd like to just thank all of today's presenters and to the diplomatic community for joining us for these thought-provoking discussions. Uh, merci à tous ceux qui ont présenté ce matin et bienvenue à Ottawa. Et merci d'avoir participé, participé au, ce matin aux discussions. I think we've been left with uh, much to think about, uh, public opinion trends, especially as they relate to the pandemic in government, ways of engaging with the gorgeous national capital region, its kilometers of pathways, which I'm just learning about and enjoying, the use of data for good decision-making, Canadian business trends, the global development of democracy, parliament during the pandemic. And we heard from a number of important in individuals, including parliamentarians and journalists. I found today's discussions informative and engaging. I hope you did as well. But I also hope that they're the beginning of a close relationship between all of you and Carleton University. I know we're honored to partner with the Carleton Initiative for Parliamentary and Diplomatic Engagement. Carleton is an excellent resource for information and advice for parliamentarians and for the diplomatic community. I'd like to speak a little bit about the Faculty of Public Affairs, in part because it's the only faculty of its kind in Canada, and I think indeed around the world, because its focus is specifically on government and civil society. That means that we educate a large portion of Canada's diplomats and public servants. We also have a very close relationship with the diplomatic community, the federal government, and non-governmental organizations. Partnering with international representatives also serves to enrich our students' educational experience. Many of our students have the opportunity to serve as interns and employees in your offices. So I invite you to reach out and connect with our faculty and with us should you see any kind of possibility for these kinds of opportunities. And I, indeed, I wanna thank you for contributing to our mission in that way. Each year, we'll look forward to this event as it draws on the close relationships between Carleton that it has developed with the members of parliament, senior public servants, and the diplomatic community. But I also really wanna thank Maureen Boyd and the whole team for all of the tremendous work that went into organizing today's event. I think it's hard to over the importance of it, particularly under pandemic conditions. I trust you will find that this initiative provides an excellent introduction to working and living as a diplomat in, the, in Canada's capital. I also think it's wonderful that diplomats from consulates across Canada had an opportunity to participate this year because of the virtual format. For those of you that are in Ottawa, however, I look forward to seeing you on campus, hopefully at some point in the near future. 
In the meantime, I'd like to invite everyone to join the faculty for some of its online events, including Author Meets Readers, which is going to take place on November 26, in which the author James Metacraft will be presenting his new book his new book, excuse me, on the evolution of modern environmental policy. That's on November 26. You can visit carlton.ca slash FPA for more information on this event and others. Again, thank you for joining us today. Merci. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Dean O'Neill. And I thank all of you for participating in this webinar. We wish you success in your posting and of course your good health. We leave you with the look back at past orientations.